Queen Lucia by E. F. Benson. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 5 One of Lucia's greatnesses lay in the fact that when she found anybody out in some act of atrocious meanness, she never indulged in any idle threats of revenge. It was sufficient that she knew, and would take suitable steps on the earliest occasion. Consequently, when it appeared from the artless conversation of the guru at lunch that the perfidious Mrs. Quantock had not even asked him whether he would like to go to Lucia's garden party or not, pending her own decision as to what she was meaning to do with him, Lucia received the information with the utmost good humour, merely saying, No doubt dear Mrs. Quantock forgot to tell you and did not announce acts of reprisal, such as striking Daisy off the list of her habitual guests for a week or two, just to give her a lesson. She even, before they sat down to lunch, telephoned over to that thwarted woman, to say that she had met the guru in the street, and they had both felt that there was some wonderful bond of sympathy between them, so he had come back with her, and they were just sitting down to tiffin. She was pleased with the word Tiffin, and also liked explaining to Daisy what it meant. Tiffin was a great success, and there was no need for the Guru to visit the kitchen in order to make something that could be eaten without struggle. He talked quite frequently about his mission here, and Lucia and Georgie and Peppino, who had come in rather late, for he had been obliged to go back to the market gardeners about the bulbs, listened entranced. Yes, it was when I went to my friend who keeps the bookshop, he said, that I knew there was an English lady who wanted Guru, and I knew I was called to her. No luggage, no anything at all, as I am, such a kind lady too, and she will get on well, but she will find some of the postures difficult, for she is what you call globe round. Was that postures when I saw her standing on one leg in the garden, asked Georgie, and when she sat down and tried to hold her toes? Yes, indeed, quite so, and difficult for Globe, but she has white soul. He looked round with a smile. I see many white souls here, he said. It is happy place when there are white souls, for to them I am sent. This was sufficient. In another minute Lucia, Georgie and Peppino were all accepted as pupils, and presently they went out into the garden, where the Guru sat on the ground in a most complicated attitude, which was obviously quite out of reach of Mrs. Quantock. One foot on thigh, other foot on other thigh, he explained, and the head and back straight. It is good to meditate so. Lucia tried to imagine meditating so, but felt that any meditation so would certainly be on the subject of broken bones. Shall I be able to do that? she asked, and what will be the effect? You will be light and active, dear lady, and, ah, here is other dear lady come to join us. Mrs. Quantock had certainly made one of her diplomatic errors on this occasion. She had acquiesced on the telephone in her guru going to tiffin with Lucia, but about the middle of her lunch she had been unable to resist the desire to know what was happening at the Hurst. She could not bear the thought that Lucia and her guru were together now, and her own note, saying that it was uncertain whether the guru would come to the garden party or not, filled her with the most uneasy apprehensions. She would sooner have acquiesced to her guru going to fifty garden parties, where all was public, and she could keep an eye under control on him, rather than that Lucia should have enticed him in, that was her phrase, like this, to Tiffin. The only consolation was that her own lunch had been practically inedible, and Robert had languished lamentably for the guru to return and save his stomach. She had left him glowering over a little mud and water called coffee. Robert, at any rate, would welcome the return of the Guru. She waddled across the lawn to where this harmonious party was sitting, and at that moment Lucia began to feel vindictive. The calm of victory which had permeated her when she brought the Guru into lunch without any bother at all was troubled and broken up, and darling Daisy's note containing the outrageous falsity that the Guru would not certainly accept an invitation which had never been permitted to reach him at all, assumed a more sinister aspect. 
Clearly now Daisy had intended to keep him to herself, a fact that she already suspected, and had made a hostile invasion. "'Guru, dear, you naughty thing,' said Mrs. Quantock playfully, after the usual salutations had passed. "'Why did you not tell your jailer you would not be home for tiffin?' The guru had unwound his legs, and stood up. "'But see, beloved lady,' he said, "'how pleasant we all are. Take not too much thought, when it is only white souls who are together.' Mrs. Quantock patted his shoulder. "'It is all good and kind, Ohm,' she said. "'I send out my message of love there.' It was necessary to descend from these high altitudes, and Lucia proceeded to do so, as in a parachute that dropped swiftly at first, and then floated in still air. "'And we're making such a lovely plan, dear Daisy,' she said. "'The Guru is going to teach us all. Classes, aren't you?' He held his hands up to his head, palms outwards, and closed his eyes. "'I seem to feel call,' he said. "'I am sent. Surely the guides tell me there is a sending of me. What you call classes. Yes, I teach. You learn. We all learn. I leave all to you. I will walk a little way off to Arba and meditate. And then, when you have arranged, you will tell Guru, who is your servant. Salam, Om. With Guru in her own house, and with every intention to annex him, it was no wonder that Lucia took the part of chairman in this meeting, that was to settle the details of the esoteric brotherhood that was to be formed in Rhizome. Had not Mrs. Quantock been actually present, Lucia, in revenge for her outrageous conduct about the garden party invitation, would probably have left her out of the classes altogether. But with her fitting firm and square in a basket chair, that creaked querulously as she moved, she could not be completely ignored. But Lucia took the lead throughout, and suggested straight away that the smoking parlour would be the most convenient place to hold the classes in. "'I should not think of invading your house, dear Daisy,' she said. "'And here is the smoking parlour which no one ever sits in, so quiet and peaceful. Yes, we shall consider that settled, then.' She turned briskly to Mrs. Quantock, and now, where shall the guru stay, she said. It would be too bad, dear Daisy, if we are all to profit by his classes, that you should have all the trouble and expense of entertaining him, for in your sweet little house he must be a great inconvenience. And I think you said that your husband had given up his dressing-room to him. Mrs. Quantock made a desperate effort to retain her property. No inconvenience at all, she said. Quite the contrary, in fact, dear. It is delightful having him, and Robert regards him as a most desirable inmate. Lucia pressed her hand feelingly. You and your husband are too unselfish, she said. Often have I said Daisy and Mr. Robert are the most unselfish people I know. Haven't I, Georgie? But we can't permit you to be so crowded. Your only spare room, you know, and your husband's dressing room, Georgie, I know you agree with me. We must not permit dear Daisy to be so unselfish. The bird-like eye produced its compelling effect on Georgie. So short a time ago he had indulged in revolutionary ideas, and had contemplated having the Guru and Olga Bracely to dinner, without even asking Lucia. Now the faint stirrings of revolt faded like snow in summer. He knew quite well what Lucia's next proposition would be. He knew, too, that he would agree to it. No, that would never do, he said. It is simply trespassing on Mrs. Quantock's good nature if she is to board and lodge him while he teaches all of us. I wish I could take him in, but with Hermie and Ursie coming tonight, I have as little room as Mrs. Quantock. He shall come here, said Lucia brightly, as if she had just that moment thought of it. There are Hamlet and Othello vacant. All her rooms were named after Shakespearean plays. And it will not be the least inconvenient, will it, Peppino? I shall really like having him here. Shall we consider that settled, then? Daisy made a perfectly futile effort to send forth a message of love to all quarters of the compass. Bitterly she repented of ever having mentioned her guru to Lucia. It had never occurred to her that she would annex him like this. While she was cudgelling her brains as to how she could arrest this powerful offensive, Lucia went sublimely on. 
Then there's the question of what we shall pay him, she said. Dear Daisy tells us that he scarcely knows what money is. But I, for one, could never dream of profiting by his wisdom if I was to pay nothing for it. The labourer is worthy of his hire, and so I suppose the teacher is. What if we pay him five shillings each a lesson? That will make a pound a lesson. Dear me, I shall be busy this August. Now how many classes shall we ask him to give us? I should say six to begin with, if everybody agrees, one every day for the next week except Sunday. That is what you all wish? Yes, then we shall consider that settled. Mrs. Quantock, still impotently rebelling, resorted to the most dire weapon in her armoury, namely sarcasm. Perhaps, darling Lucia, she said, it would be well to ask my guru if he has anything to say to your settlings. England is a free country still, even if you happen to have come from India. Lucia had a deadlier weapon than sarcasm, which was the apparent unconsciousness of there having been any. For it is no use plunging a dagger into your enemy's heart if it produces no effect whatever on him. She clapped her hands together and gave her peal of silvery laughter. What a good idea, she said. Then you would like me to go and tell him what we propose, just as you like. I will trot away, shall I, and see if he agrees. Don't think of stirring, dear Daisy. I know how you feel the heat. Sit quiet in the shade. As you know, I am a real salamander. The sun is never troppo caldo for me. She tripped off to where the guru was sitting in that wonderful position. She had read the article in the encyclopedia about yoga right through again this morning, and had quite made up her mind, as indeed her proceedings had just shown, that yoga was, to put it irreverently, to be her august stunt. He was still so deep in meditation that he could only look dreamily in her direction as she approached. But then, with a long sigh, he got up. This is beautiful place, he said. It is full of sweet influences, and I have had high talk with guides. Lucia felt thrilled. And do tell me what they said to you, she exclaimed. They told me to follow where I was led. They said they would settle everything for me in wisdom and love. This was most encouraging, for decidedly Lucia had been settling for him and the opinion of the guides was thus a direct personal testimonial. Any faint twitchings of conscience, they were of the very faintest, that she had grabbed dear Daisy's property, were once and forever quieted, and she proceeded confidently to unfold the settlements of wisdom and love, which met with the guru's entire approval. He shut his eyes a moment and breathed deeply. They give peace and blessing, he said. It is they who ordered that it should be so. Om. He seemed to sink into profound depths of meditation, and Lucia hurried back to the group she had left. It is all too wonderful, she said. The guides have told him that they were settling everything for him in wisdom and love, so we may be sure we were right in our plans. How lovely to think that we have been guided by them. Dear Daisy, how wonderful he is! I will send across for his things, shall I, and I will have Hamlet and Othello made ready for him. Bitter though it was to part with her guru, it was impious to rebel against the ordinances of the guides. But there was a trace of human resentment in Daisy's answer. Things, she exclaimed, he hasn't got a thing in the world. Every material possession chains us down to earth. You will soon come to that, darling Lucia. It occurred to Georgie that the guru had certainly got a bottle of brandy, but there was no use in introducing a topic that might lead to discord, and indeed, even as Lucia went indoors to see about Hamlet and Othello, the guru himself, having emerged from meditation, joined them and sat down by Mrs. Quantock. Beloved lady, he said, all is peace and happiness. The guides have spoken to me so lovingly of you, and they say it is best your guru should come here. Perhaps I shall return later to your kind house. They smiled when I asked that, but just now they send me here. There is more need of me here, for already you have so much light. Certainly the guys were very tactful people, for nothing could have soothed Mrs. Quantock so effectually as a message of that kind, which she would certainly report to Lucia when she returned from seeing about Hamlet and Othello. 
Oh, do they say I have much light already, Guru dear? she asked. That is nice of them. Surely they said it, and now I shall go back to your house, and leave sweet thoughts there for you. And shall I send sweet thoughts to the home of the kind gentleman next door? Georgie eagerly welcomed this proposition, for with Hermie and Ursy coming that evening, he felt that he would have plenty of use for sweet thoughts. He even forbore to complete in his own mind the conjecture that was forming itself there, namely that though the guru would be leaving sweet thoughts for Mrs. Quantock, he would probably be taking away the brandy bottle for himself. But Georgie knew he was only too apt to indulge in secret cynicisms and perhaps there was no brandy to take away by this time. And lo and behold, he was being cynical again. The sun was still hot when, half an hour afterwards, he got into the open cab which he had ordered to take him to the station to meet Hermie and Ursie, and he put up his umbrella with its white linen cover to shield him from it. He did not take the motor, because either Hermie or Ursie would have insisted on driving it, and he did not choose to put himself in their charge. In all the years that he had lived at Rhizome, he never remembered a time when social events, work, he called it, had been so exciting and varied. There were Hermie and Ursy coming this evening, and Olga Braceley and her husband. Olga Braceley and Mr. Shuttleworth sounded vaguely improper. Georgie rather liked that. Were coming tomorrow, and there was Lucia's garden party the day after, and every day there was to be a lesson from the Guru so that God alone knew when Georgie would have a moment to himself for his embroidery or to practice the Mozart trio. But with his hair chestnut-coloured to the very roots, and his shining nails and his comfortable boots, he felt extremely young and fit for anything. Soon, under the influence of the new creed with its postures and breathings, he would feel younger and more vigorous yet. But he wished that it had been he who had found this pamphlet on Eastern philosophies, which had led Mrs. Quantock to make the inquiries that had resulted in the epiphany of the Guru. Of course, when once Lucia had heard about it, she was certain to constitute herself head and leader of the movement. And it was really remarkable how completely she had done that. In that meeting in the garden just now, she had just sailed through Mrs. Quantock as calmly as a steamer cuts through the waters of the sea, throwing her off from her penetrating bows like a spent wave. But... Baffled though she was for the moment, Georgie had been aware that Mrs. Quantock seethed with revolutionary ideas. She deeply resented this confiscation of what was certainly her property, though she was impotent to stop it, and Georgie knew just what she felt. It was all very well to say that Lucia's schemes were entirely in accord with the purposes of the guides. That might be so, but Mrs. Quantock would not cease to think that she had been robbed. Yet nothing mattered if all the class found themselves getting young and active and loving and excellent under this tuition. It was that notion which had taken such entire command of them all, and for his part Georgie did not really care who owned the guru, so to speak, if only he got the benefit of his teachings. For social purposes Lucia had annexed him, and, doubtless with him in the house, she could get little instructions and hints that would not count as a lesson. But, after all, Georgie had still got Olga Bracely to himself, for he had not breathed a word of her advent to Lucia. He felt rather like one who, when revolutionary ideas are in the air, had concealed a revolver in his pocket. He did not formulate to himself precisely what he was going to do with it, but it gave him a sense of power to know it was there. The train came in, but he looked in vain for his sisters. They had distinctly said they were arriving by it, but in a couple of minutes it was perfectly clear that they had done nothing of the kind. For the only person who got out was Mrs. Weston's cook, who, as all the world knew, went into Brinton every Wednesday to buy fish. At the rear of the train, however, was an immense quantity of luggage being taken out, which could not all be Mrs. Weston's fish, and indeed, even at that distance there was something familiar to Georgie about a very large green holdall which was dumped there. Perhaps Hermie and Ursie had travelled in the van because it was such a lark, or for some other tomboy reason. And he went down to the platform to investigate. 
There were bags of golf clubs, and a dog, and portmanteau, and even as the conviction dawned on him that he had seen some of these objects before, the guard, to whom Georgie always gave half a crown when he travelled by this train, presented him with a note scrawled in pencil. It ran, Dearest Georgie, it was such a lovely day that when we got to Paddington, Ursy and I decided to bicycle down instead. So, for a lark, we sent our things on, and we may arrive tonight, but probably tomorrow. Take care of Tiptree, and give him plenty of jam. He loves it. Yours, Hermie. P.S. Tipsy Poozy doesn't really bite. It's only his fun. Georgie crumpled up this odious epistle, and became aware that Tipsy Poozy, a lean Irish terrier, was regarding him with peculiar disfavour, and showing all his teeth, probably in fun. In pursuance of this humorous idea, he then darted towards Georgie, and would have been extremely funny if he had not been handicapped by the bag of golf clubs to which he was tethered. As it was, he pursued him down the platform, towing the clubs after him, till he got entangled in them and fell down. Georgie hated dogs at any time, though he had never hated one so much as Tipsy Poozy, and the problems of life became more complicated than ever. Certainly he was not going to drive back with Tipsy Poozy in his cab, and it became necessary to hire another for that abominable hound and the rest of the luggage. And what on earth was to happen when he arrived home if Tipsy Poozy did not drop his fun and become serious? Foljambi, it is true, liked dogs, so perhaps dogs liked her. But it is most tiresome of Hermie, thought Georgie bitterly. I wonder what the guru would do. There ensued a very trying ten minutes, in which the station-master, the porters, Georgie and Mrs. Weston's maid, all called Tipsy Boozy a good dog, as he lay on the ground, snapping promiscuously at those who praised him. Eventually a valiant porter picked up the bag of clubs, and, by holding them out in front of him at the extreme length of his arms, in the manner of a fishing-rod, with Tipsy Poozy on a short chain at the other end of the bag, like a savage fish, cursing and swearing, managed to propel him into the cab. And there was another half-crown gone. Georgie thereupon got into his cab and sped homewards, in order to arrive there first and consult with Foljambi. Foljambi usually thought of something. For Jambi came out at the noise of the arriving wheels, and Georgie explained the absence of his sisters and the advent of an atrocious dog. He's very fierce, he said, but he likes jam. For Jambi gave that supreme smile which sometimes Georgie resented. Now he hailed it as if it was an angel face's smile. I'll see to him, sir, she said. I've brought up your tea. But you'll take care for Jambi, won't you? he asked. I expect he had better take care, returned the intrepid woman. Georgie, as he often said, trusted Foljambi completely, which must explain why he went into his drawing-room, shut the door, and looked out of the window when the second cab arrived. She opened the door, put her arm inside, and next moment emerged again with Tipsy Poozy on the end of his chain, making extravagant exhibitions of delight. Then, to George's horror, the drawing-room door opened, and in came Tipsy Poozy without any chain at all. Rapidly sending a message of love in all directions, like an SOS call, Georgie put a small chair in front of him to shield his legs. Tipsy Poozy evidently thought it was a game, and hid behind the sofa to rush out again from ambush. Just got snappy being tied to those golf clubs, remarked Foljambi. But Georgie, as he put some jam into his saucer, could not help wondering whether the message of love had not done it. He dined alone, for Hermie and Ursie did not appear, and had a great polishing of his knick-knacks afterwards while waiting for them. No one ever felt anxious at the non-arrival of those sisters, for they always turned up from their otter-hunting or their golf sooner or later, chiefly later, in the highest spirits at the larks they had had, with amazingly dirty hands and prodigious appetite. But when twelve o'clock struck, he decided to give up all idea of their appearance that night, and, having given Tipsy Poovy some more jam and a comfortable bed in the woodshed, he went upstairs to his room. Though he knew it was still possible that he might be raised by wild cooees and showers of gravel at his window, 
and have to come down and minister to their gross appetites, the prospect seemed improbable, and he soon went to sleep. Georgie awoke with a start some hours later, wondering what had disturbed him. There was no gravel rattling on his window, no violent ringing of bicycle bells, nor loud genial shouts outraging the decorous calm of Rhizome, but certainly he had heard something. Next moment the repeated noise sent his heart leaping into his throat, for quite distinctly he heard a muffled sound in the room below, which he instantly diagnosed with fatal certainty as burglars. The first emotion that mingled itself with the sheer terror was a passionate regret that Hermie and Ursy had not come. They would have thought it tremendous larks, and would have invented some wonderful offensive with fire irons and golf clubs and dumbbells. Even Tipsy Poozy, the lately aboard, would have been a sucker in this crisis, and why, oh, why had Georgie not had him to sleep in his bedroom, instead of making him cosy in the woodshed? He would have let Tipsy Poozy sleep on his lovely blue quilt for the remainder of his days, if only Tipsy Poozy could have been with him now, ready to have fun with the burglar below. As it was, the servants were in the attics at the top of the house, Dicky slept out, and Georgie was all alone, with the prospect of having to defend his property at risk of his life. Even at this moment, as he sat up in bed, blanched with terror, these miscreants might be putting his treasure into their pockets. The thought of a Fabergé cigarette case, the Louis XVI snuff-box, and the Queen Anne toy porringer, which he had inherited all these years, made even life seem cheap, for life would be intolerable without them. And he sprang out of bed, groped for his slippers, since, until he had made a plan, it was wiser not to show a light, and shuffled noiselessly towards the door. End of chapter. Queen Lucia by E. F. Benson. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 6. The door handle felt icy to fingers already frozen with fright, but he stood firmly grasping it, ready to turn it noiselessly when he had quite made up his mind what to do. The first expedient that suggested itself with an overpowering sweetness of relief was that of locking his door and going back to bed again, and pretending that he had heard nothing. But apart from the sheer cowardice of that, which he did not mind so much, as nobody would ever know his guilt, the thought of the burglar going off quite unmolested with his property was intolerable. Even if he could not summon up enough courage to get downstairs with his life and a poker in his hand, he must at least give them a good fright. They had frightened him, so he would frighten them. They should not have it all their own way, and if he decided not to attack them, or him, single-handed, he could at least thump on the floor and call out burglars at the top of his voice, or shout Charles, Henry, Thomas, as if summoning a bevy of stalwart footmen. The objection to this course, however, would be that Fuljambi or somebody else might hear him, and in this case, if he did not then go downstairs to mortal combat, the knowledge of his cowardice would be the property of others beside himself. And all the time he hesitated, they were probably filling their pockets with his dearest possessions. He tried to send out a message of love, but he was totally unable to do so. Then the little clock in his mantelpiece struck two, which was a miserable hour, sundered so far from dawn. Though he had lived through years of agony since he got out of bed, the actual passage of time as he stood frozen to the door handle was but the duration of a few brief seconds. And then, making a tremendous call on his courage, he felt his way to his fireplace and picked up the poker. The tongs and shovel rattled treacherously, and he hoped that had not been heard for the essence of his plan, though he had yet no idea what that plan was, must be silenced till some awful surprise broke upon them. If only he could summon the police, he could come rushing downstairs with his poker, as the professional supporters of the law gained an entrance to his house. But unfortunately the telephone was downstairs, and he could not reasonably hope to carry on a conversation with the police station without being overheard by the burglars. 
He opened his door with so masterly a movement that there was no sound either from the hinges nor from the handle as he turned it, and peered out. The hall below was dark, but a long pencil of light came from the drawing-room, which showed where the reckless brutes must be, and there, too, alas, was his case of treasures. Then, suddenly, he heard the sound of a voice speaking very low, and another voice answered it. At that George's heart sank, for this proved that there must be at least two burglars, and the odds against him were desperate. After that came a low, cruel laugh, the unmistakable sound of the rattle of knives and forks, and the explosive uncorking of a bottle. At that his heart sank even lower yet, for he had read that cool, habitual burglars always had supper before they got to work, and therefore he was about to deal with a gang of professionals. Also that explosive uncorking clearly indicated champagne, and he knew that they were feasting on his best. And how wicked of them to take their unhallowed meal in his drawing-room, for there was no proper table there, and they would be making a dreadful mess over everything. A current of cool night air swept up the stairs, and Georgie saw the panel of light from the open drawing-room door diminish in width, and presently the door shut with a soft thud, leaving him in the dark. At that his desperation seemed pressed and concentrated into a moment of fictitious courage, for he unerringly reasoned that they had left the drawing-room window open, and that perhaps in a few moments now they would have finished their meal, and with bulging pockets would step forth unchallenged into the night. Why had he never had bolts put on his shutters like Mrs. Weston, who lived in nightly terror of burglars? But it was too late to think of that now, for it was impossible to ask them to step out till he had put bolts up, and then, when he was ready, begin again. He could not let them go gorged with his champagne and laden with his treasures without reprisals of some sort. And keeping his thoughts steadily away from revolvers and clubs and sandbags, walked straight downstairs, threw open the drawing-room door, and, with his poker grasped in his shaking hand, cried out in a faint, thin voice, If you move, I shall fire. There was a moment of dead silence, and, a little dazzled with the light, he saw what faced him. At opposite ends of his Chippendale sofa sat Hermy and Ursy. Hermy had her mouth open and held a bun in her dirty hands. Ursy had her mouth shut, and her cheeks were bulging. Between them was a ham and a loaf of bread and a pot of marmalade and a stilton cheese, and on the floor was a bottle of champagne with two brimming, bubbling teacups full of wine. The cork and the wire and the tinfoil they had, with some show of decency, thrown into the fireplace. Hermy put down her bun and gave a great shout of laughter. Ursy's mouth was disgustingly full, and she exploded. Then they lay back against the arms of the sofa and howled. Georgie was very much vexed. Upon my word, Hermy, he said, and found it was not nearly a strong enough expression, and in a moment of ungovernable irritation he said, Damn it all! Hermy showed signs of recovery first, and as Georgie came back after shutting the window, could find her voice while Ursy collected small fragments of ham and bread, which she had partially chewed. "'Lord, what a lark!' she said. "'Georgie, it's the most ripping lark!' Ursy pointed to the poker. "'He'll fire if we move,' she cried, or poke the fire, was it? "'Ask another!' screamed Hermy. "'Oh, dear, he thought we were burglars and came down with a poker. Brave boy! It's positively the limit. Have a drink, Georgie.' Suddenly her eyes grew round and awestruck, and pointing with her finger to George's shoulder, she went off into another yell of laughter. Ursy, his hair, she said, and buried her face in a soft cushion. Naturally, Georgie had not put his hair in order when he came downstairs, for nobody thinks about things like that when he's going to encounter burglars single-handed. And there was his bald pate and his long tresses hanging down one side. It was most annoying, but when an irremediable annoyance has absolutely occurred, the only possible thing for a decent person to do is to take it as lightly as possible. 
Georgie rose gallantly to the occasion, gave a little squeal, and ran from the room. Down again presently, he called out, and had a heavy fall on the stairs as he went up to his bedroom. There he had a short argument with himself. It was possible to slam his door, go to bed, and be very polite in the morning. But that would never do. Hermy and Ursy would have a joke against him for ever. It was really much better to share in the joke, identifying himself with it. So he brushed his hair in the orthodox fashion, put on a very smart dressing gown, and came tripping downstairs again. My dears, what fun, he said. Let's all have supper, but let's move into the dining room where there's a table, and I'll get another bottle of wine and some glasses, and we'll bring Tipsy Poozy in. You naughty girls, fancy arriving at a time like this. I suppose your plan was to go very quietly to bed, and come down to breakfast in the morning and give me a fine surprise. Tell me about it now. So presently Tipsy Poozy was having his marmalade, which did just as well as jam, and they were all eating slices off the ham and stuffing them into split buns. Yes, we thought we might as well do it all in one go, said Hermie. And it's a hundred and twenty miles if it's a yard, and then it was so late when we got here we thought we wouldn't disturb you, especially as the drawing-room window wasn't bolted. Bicycles outside, said Ursy, they'll just have to be out at grass till morning. Oh, tipsy, ipsy, poozy, woozy, how is you? Hope he behaved like the good little tip-tree that he is, Georgie. Oh, yes, we made great friends, said Georgie, sketchily. He was a wee bit upset at the station, but then he had a good tea with his uncle Georgie, and played hide-and-seek. Rather rashly, Georgie made a face at Tiptree, the sort of face which amuses children, but it didn't amuse Tiptree, who made another face in which teeth played a prominent part. Fool dog, said Hermy, carelessly smacking him across the nose. Always hit him if he shows his teeth, Georgie. Pass the fizz. Well, so we got through the drawing-room window, continued Ursy, and golly, we were hungry, so we foraged. And there we were, jolly plucky of you, Georgie, to come down and beard us. Real sport, said Hermy. And how's old Folder old array? Why didn't she come down and fight us too? Georgie guessed that Hermie was making a humorous allusion to Foljambi, who was the one person in Rhizome whom his sisters seemed to hold in respect. Ursy had once set a booby trap for Georgie, but the mixed biscuits and Brazil nuts had descended on Foljambi instead. On that occasion, Foljambi, girt about in impenetrable calm, had behaved as if nothing had happened, and trod on biscuits and Brazil nuts without a smile unaware to all appearance that there was anything whatever crunching and exploding beneath her feet. That had somehow quelled the two, who, as soon as she left the room again, swept up the mess and put the uninjured Brazil nuts back into the dessert dish. It would never do if Foljambi lost her prestige and was alluded to by some outrageously slangy name. If you mean Foljambi, said Georgie icily, it was because I didn't think it worth while to disturb her. In spite of their ride, the indefatigable sisters were up early next morning, and the first thing Georgie saw out of his bathroom window was the pair of them practising lifting shots over the ducking pond on the green till breakfast was ready. He had given a short account of last night's adventure to Foljambi when she called him, omitting the episode about his hair, and her disapproval was strongly indicated by her silence then and the studied contempt of her manner to the sisters when they came in to breakfast. "'Hello, Foljambi,' said Hermie. "'We had a rare lark last night.' "'So I understand, miss,' said Foljambi. "'Got in through the drawing-room window,' said Hermie, hoping to make her smile. "'Indeed, miss,' said Foljambi. "'Have you any orders for the car, sir?' "'Oh, Georgie, may we run over to the links this morning?' asked Hermie. "'Mayn't Dicky Bird take us there?' She glanced at Foljambi to see whether this brilliant wit afforded her any amusement. Apparently it didn't. "'Tell Dicky to be round at half-past ten, said Georgie. "'Yes, sir.' "'Hurrah!' said Ursy. "'Come to, Foljambi, and we'll have a three-ball match.' "'No, thank you, miss,' said Foljambi, and sailed from the room, looking down her nose. "'Golly, what an iceberg!' said Hermie, when the door was quite shut. 
Georgie was not sorry to have the morning to himself, for he wanted to have a little quiet practice at the Mozart trio before he went over to Lucia's at half-past eleven, the hour when she had arranged to run through it for the first time. He would also have time to do a few posturing exercises before the yoga class, which was to take place in Lucia's smoking parlour at half-past twelve. That would make a pretty busy morning, and as for the afternoon, there would be sure to be some callers, since the arrival of his sisters had been expected. And after that he had to go to the Ambermere Arms for his visit to Olga Braceley. And what was he to do about her with regard to Lucia? Already he had been guilty of disloyalty, for Lady Ambermere had warned him of the prima donna's arrival yesterday, and he had not instantly communicated that really great piece of news to Lucia. Should he make such amends as were in his power for that omission, or, greatly daring, should he keep her to himself, as Mrs. Quantock so fervently wished that she had done with regard to the Guru? After the adventure of last night, he felt he ought to be able to look any situation in the face, but he found himself utterly unable to conceive himself manly and erect before the bird-like eyes of the Queen, if she found that Olga Braceley had been at Rhizom for the day of her garden party, and that Georgie, knowing it and having gone to see her, had not informed the court of that fact. The spirit of Bolshevism, the desire to throw off all authority and act independently, which had assailed him yesterday, returned now with redoubled force. If he had been perfectly certain that he would not be found out, there is no doubt he would have kept it from her. And yet, after all, what was the glory of going to see Olga Braceley, and perhaps even entertaining her here, if all Rhizom did not turn green with jealousy? Moreover, there was every chance of being found out, for Lady Ambermere would be at the garden party to-morrow, and she would be sure to wonder why Lucia had not asked Olga. Then it would come out that Lucia didn't know of that eminent presence, and Lady Ambermere would be astonished that Georgie had not told her. Thus he would be in the situation which his imagination was unable to face, although he had thrown the drawing-room door open in the middle of the night and announced that he would fire with his boker. No, he would have to tell Lucia when he went to read the Mozart trio with her for the first time, and very likely she would call on Olga Braceley herself, though nobody had asked her to, and take all the wind out of George's sails. Sickening though that would be, he could not face the alternative, and he opened his copy of the Mozart trio with a sigh. Lucia did push and shove and have everything her own way. Anyhow, he would not tell her that Olga and her husband were dining at the hall tonight. He would not even tell her that her husband's name was Shuttleworth. And Lucia might make a dreadful mistake and ask Mr. and Mrs. Braceley. That would be jam for Georgie, and he could easily imagine himself saying to Lucia, My dear, I thought you must have known that she had married Mr. Shuttleworth and kept her maiden name. How tiresome for you! They're so touchy about that sort of thing. Georgie heard the tinkle of the treble part of the Mozart trio. Lucia always took the treble because it had more tune in it, though she pretended that she had not Georgie's fine touch which made the bass effective, as he let himself in to Shakespeare's garden a few minutes before the appointed time. Lucia must have seen him from the window, for the subdued noise of the piano ceased even before he had got as far as Perdita's garden round the sundial, and she opened the door to him. The faraway look was in her eyes, and the black undulations of her hair had encroached a little on her forehead. But, after all, others besides Lucia had trouble with their hair, and Georgie only sympathised. Giorgino mio, she said, it is all being so wonderful. There seems a new atmosphere about the house since my guru came. Something holy and peaceful. Do you not notice it? Delicious, said Georgie, inhaling the potpourri. What is he doing now? Meditating and preparing for our class. I do hope dear Daisy will not bring in discordant elements. Oh, but that's not likely, is it? said Georgie. I thought he said she had so much light. Yes, he did, but now he's a little troubled about her, I think. 
She did not want him to go away from her house, and she even sent over here for some silk pyjamas belonging to her husband, which he thought she had given him. But Robert didn't think so at all. The guru brought them across yesterday after he had left good thoughts for her in her house. But it was the guides who wished him to come here. They told him so distinctly. It would have been very wrong of me not to do as they said. She gave a great sigh. Let us have an hour with Mozart, she said, and repel all thought of discord. My guru says that music and flowers are good influences for those who are walkers on the way. He says that my love for both of them, which I have had all my life, will help me very much. For one moment the mundane world obtruded itself into the calm peace. Any news in particular, she asked. I saw you drive back from the station yesterday afternoon, for I happened to be looking out of the window in a little moment of leisure. The guru says I work too hard, by the way. And your sisters were not with you, and yet there were two cabs and a quantity of luggage. Did they not come? Georgie gave a respectably accurate account of all that had happened, omitting the fact of his terror when he first awoke, for that was not really a happening, and had had no effect on his subsequent proceedings. He also admitted the adventure about his hair, for that was quite extraneous, and said what fun they had all had over their supper at half-past two this morning. I think you are marvellously brave, Georgie, said she, and most good-natured. You must have been sending out love, and so were full of it yourself, and that casts out fear. She spread the music open. Anything else? she asked. Georgie took his seat and put his rings on the candle bracket. Oh, yes, he said, Olga Bracely, the prima donna, you know, and her husband, are arriving at the Ambermere Arms this afternoon for a couple of days. The old fire kindled. No, exclaimed Lucia, then they'll be here for my party tomorrow. Fancy if she would come and sing for us. I shall certainly leave cards today and write later in the evening asking her. I've been asked to go and see her, said Georgie, not proudly. The music rest fell down with a loud slap, but Lucia paid no attention. Let us go together, then, she said. Who asked you to call on her? Lady Ambermere, he said. When she was in here yesterday, she never mentioned it to me, but she would certainly think it very odd of me not to call on friends of hers and be polite to them. What time shall we go? Georgie made up his mind that wild horses should not drag from him the fact that Olga's husband's name was Shuttleworth. For here was Lucia grabbing at his discovery, just as she had grabbed at Daisy's discovery, who was now her guru. She should call him Mr. Bracely then. Somewhere about six, do you think, said he, inwardly raging. He looked up and distinctly saw that sharp, foxy expression cross Lucia's face, which, from long knowledge of her, he knew to betoken that she had thought of some new plan. But she did not choose to reveal it, and re-erected the music rest. That will do beautifully, she said, and now for our heavenly Mozart. You must be patient with me, Georgie, for you know how badly I read. Caro, how difficult it looks. I am frightened. Lucia never saw such a dreadful thing to read. And it had been those very bars which Georgie had heard through the open window just now. Georgie's is much more dreadful, he said, remembering the double sharp that came in the second bar. Georgie frightened too at reading it. Ooh, he gave a little scream. Cattivo Mozart to write anything so dreadfully diffy. It was quite clear at the class this morning that, though the pupils were quite interested in the abstract messages of love which they were to shoot out in all directions, and in the atmosphere of peace with which they were to surround themselves, the branch of the subject which thrilled them to the marrow was the breathing exercises and contortions which, if persevered in, would give them youth and activity faultless digestions and indefatigable energy. They all sat on the floor and stopped up alternate nostrils and held their breath till Mrs. Quantock got purple in the face and Georgie and Lucia red and expelled their breath again with sudden puffs that set the rushes on the floor quivering or with long quiet exhalations. Then there were certain postures to be learned in one of which entailing the bending of the body backwards 
two of George's trouser buttons came off with a sharp snap, and he felt the corresponding member of his braces, thus violently released, spring up to his shoulder. Various other embarrassing noises issued from Lucia and Daisy that sounded like the bursting of strings and tapes, but everybody pretended to hear nothing at all, or covered up the report of those explosions with coughings and clearings of the throat. But apart from these discordances, everything was fairly harmonious indeed. So far from Daisy introducing discords, she wore a fixed smile, which it would have been purely cynical to call superior, when Lucia asked some amazingly simple question with regard to Ohm. She sighed, too, at intervals, but these sighs were expressive of nothing but patience and resignation, till Lucia's ignorance of the most elementary doctrines was enlightened. And though she rather pointedly looked in any direction but hers, and appeared completely unaware of her presence, she had not, after all, come here to look at Lucia, but to listen to her own, whatever Lucia might say, guru. At the end, Lucia, with her faraway look, emerged, you might say, in a dazed condition from hearing about the fastness of Tibet, where the guru had been in commune with the guides, whose wisdom he interpreted to them. I feel such a difference already, she said dreamily. I feel as if I could never be hasty or worried any more at all. Don't you experience that, dear Daisy? Yes, dear, said she. I went through all that at my first lesson. Didn't I, Guru, dear? I felt it too, said Georgie, unwilling not to share in these benefits, and surreptitiously tightening his trouser strap to compensate for the loss of buttons. And am I to do that swaying exercise before every meal? Yes, Georgie, said Lucia, saving her guru from the trouble of answering. Five times to the right, and five times to the left, and then five times backwards and forwards. I felt so young and light just now when we did it that I thought I was rising into the air. Didn't you, Daisy? Daisy smiled kindly. No, dear, that is levitation, she said, and comes a very long way on. She turned briskly towards her guru. Will you tell them about that time when you levitated at Paddington Station, she said, or will you keep that for when Mrs. Lucas gets rather further on? You must be patient, dear Lucia. We all have to go through the early stages before we get to that. Mrs. Quantock spoke as if she was in the habit of levitating herself, and it was but reasonable, in spite of the love that was swirling about them all, that Lucia should protest against such an attitude. Humility, after all, was the first essential to progress on the way. Yes, dear, she said, we will tread these early stages together and encourage each other. Georgie went home feeling also unusually light and hungry, for he had paid special attention to the exercise that enabled him to have his liver and digestive organs in complete control, but that did not prevent him from devoting his mind to arriving at that which had made Lucia look so sharp and foxy during their conversation about Olga Bracely. He felt sure that she was meaning to steal a march on him, and she was planning to draw first blood with the prima donna and, as likely as not, claim her for her own, with the same odious greed as she was already exhibiting with regard to the guru. All these years Georgie had been her faithful servant and coadjutor. Now, for the first time, the spirit of independence had begun to seethe within him. The scales were falling from his eyes, and just as he turned into shelter of his mulberry tree, he put on his spectacles to see how Rhizome was getting on without him to assist at the morning Parliament. His absence and Mrs. Quantock's would be sure to evoke comment, and since the yoga classes were always to take place at half-past twelve, the fact that they would never be there would soon rise to the level of a first-class mystery. It would, of course, begin to leak out that they and Lucia were having a course of Eastern philosophy that made its pupils young and light and energetic and there was a sensation. Like all great discoveries, the solution of Lucia's foxy look broke on him with the suddenness of a lightning flash. And, since it had been settled that she should call for him at six, he stationed himself in the window of his bathroom, which commanded a perfect view of the village green and the entrance to the Ambermere Arms, at five. 
He brought up with him a pair of opera glasses with the intention of taking them to bits, so he had informed Foljambi, and washing their lenses. But he did not at once proceed about this, merely holding them ready to hand for use. Hermy and Ursy had gone back to their golf again after lunch, and so callers would be told that they were all out. Thus he could wash the lenses when he chose to do so, uninterrupted. The minutes passed on pleasantly enough, for there was plenty going on. The two Miss Antropuses frisked about the green, jumping over the stocks in their playful way, and running round the duck pond in the eternal hope of attracting Colonel Boucher's attention to their pretty nimble movements. For many years past they had tried to gain George's serious attention without any result, and lately they had turned to Colonel Boucher. There was Mrs. Antropus there, too, with her ham-like face and her ear-trumpet, and Mrs. Weston was being pushed around and around the asphalt path below the elms in her bath chair. She hated going slow, and her gardener and his boy took turns with her during her hour's carriage exercise, and propelled her amid streams of perspiration at a steady four miles an hour. As she passed Mrs. Antropus, she shouted something at her, and Mrs. Antropus returned her reply when next she came round. Suddenly, all these interesting objects vanished completely from George's ken, for his dark suspicions were confirmed, and there was Lucia in her Hightum hat and her Hightum gown, making her gracious way across the garden. She had distinctly been wearing one of the scrub this morning at the class so she must have changed after lunch, which was an unheard-of thing to do for a mere stroll on the green. Georgie knew well that this was no mere stroll. She was on her way to pay a call of the most formal and magnificent kind. She did not deviate a hair-breadth from her straight course to the door of the arms. She just waggled her hand to Mrs. Antropus, blew a kiss to her sprightly daughters, made a gracious bow to Colonel Boucher, who stood up and took his hat off, and went on with the inexorability of the march of destiny, or of fate knocking at the door in the immortal Fifth Symphony. And, in her hand, she carried a note. Through his glasses Georgie could see it quite plainly, and it was not a little folded-up sheet, such as she commonly used, but a square, thick envelope. She disappeared in the arms, and Georgie began thinking feverishly. A great deal depended on how long she stopped there. A few little happenings beguiled the period of waiting. Mrs. Weston desisted from her wild career and came to anchor on the path just opposite the door into the arms, while the gardener's boy sank exhausted onto the grass. It was quite easy to guess that she proposed to have a chat with Lucia when she came out. Similarly, the Miss Antropuses, who had paid no attention to her at all before, ceased from their pretty gambolings, and ran up to talk to her, so they wanted a word too. Colonel Boucher, a little less obviously, began throwing sticks into the ducking-pond for his bulldog, for Lucia would be obliged to pass the ducking-pond, and Mrs. Antropus examined the stocks very carefully, as if she had never seen them before. And then, before a couple of minutes had elapsed, Lucia came out. She had no longer the note in her hand, and Georgie began taking his opera glasses to bits in order to wash the lenses. For the present they had served their purpose. She has left a note on Olga Braceley, said Georgie, quite aloud, so powerful was the current of his thoughts. Then, as a corollary, came the further proposition which might be considered as proved. But she had not seen her. The justice of his conclusion was soon proved, for Lucia had hardly disengaged herself from the group of her subjects, and traversed the green on her way back to her house, when a motor passed George's bathroom window, closely followed by a second, both drew up at the entrance to the Ambermere Arms. With the speed of a practised optician, Georgie put his opera glass together again, and after looking through the wrong end of it in his agitation, was in time to see a man get out of the second car and hold the carriage door open for the occupants of the first. A lady got out first, tall and slight in figure, who stood there unwinding her motor veil. Then she turned round again, and with a thump of his heart that surprised Georgie with its violence, he beheld the well-remembered features of his Brunhilde. 
Swiftly he passed into his bedroom next door, and arrayed himself in his summer items. A fresh and almost pearly suit of white duck, a mauve tie with an amethyst pin in it, socks tightly braced up of precisely the same colour as the tie, so that an imaginative beholder might have conjectured that on this warm day the end of his tie had melted and run down his legs. Buckskin shoes with tall slim heels and a straw hat completed this pretty item. He had meant to wear it for the first time at Lucia's party tomorrow, but now, after her meanness, she deserved to be punished. All Rhizom should see it before she did. The group round Mrs. Weston's chair was still engaged in conversation when Georgie came up, and he casually let slip what a bore it was to pay calls on such a lovely day. But he had promised to visit Miss Olga Braceley, who had just arrived. So there was another nasty one for Lucia, since now all Rhizom would know of her actual arrival before Lucia did. "'And who, Mr. Georgie?' asked Mrs. Antrobus, presenting her trumpet to him, in the manner in which an elephant presents its trunk to receive a bun. Who was that with her?' "'Oh, her husband, Mr. Shuttleworth,' said Georgie. "'They have just been married, and are on their honeymoon.' "'And if that was not another staggerer for Lucia? "'It is diffy, as George would say, to know what a staggerer is, "'for Lucia would be last of all to know that this was not Mr. Braceley.' "'And will they be at Mrs. Lucas' party tomorrow? asked Mrs. Weston. "'Oh, does she know them?' asked Georgie. "'Ho, oh, ho, by Jove!' began Colonel Boucher. "'Very handsome woman. Envy you, my boy. Pity it's their honeymoon. Ha!' Oh. Mrs. Antropus' trumpet was turned in his direction at this moment, and she heard these daring remarks. "'Naughty,' she said, and Georgie, the envied, passed in into the inn. He sent in his card, on which he had thought it prudent to write from Lady Ambermere, and was presently led through into the garden behind the building. There she was, tall and lovely and welcoming, and held out a most cordial hand. "'How kind of you to come and see us,' she said. "'Georgie, this is Mr. Pilson, my husband.' "'How do you do, Mr. Shuttleworth?' said Georgie, to show he knew, though his own Christian name had given him quite a start for the moment. He had almost thought she was speaking to him. "'And so Lady Ambermere asked you to come and see us,' Olga went on. "'I think that was much kinder of her than to ask us to dinner. I hate going out to dinner in the country almost as much as I hate not going out to dinner in town. Besides, with that great hook nose of hers, I'm always afraid that in an absent moment I might scratch her on the head and say, "'Pretty Polly!' "'Is she a friend of yours, Mr. Pilson? I hope so, because everyone likes his best friends being laughed at.' Up till that moment Georgie was prepared to indicate that Lady Ambermere was the hand and he the glove, but evidently that would not impress Olga in the least. He laughed in a most irreverent manner instead. "'Don't let us go,' she went on. "'Georgie, can't you send a telegram saying that we have just discovered a subsequent engagement, and then we'll ask Mr. Pilson to show us round this utterly adorable place and dine with us afterwards?' That would be so much nicer. Fancy living here. Oh, and do tell me, Mr. Pilson, I found a note when I arrived half an hour ago from Mrs. Lucas, asking me and Mr. Shuttleworth to go to a garden party tomorrow. She said she didn't even hope that I should remember her, but would we come? Who is she? Really, I don't think she can remember me very well, if she thinks I'm Mrs. Braceley. Georgie says I must have been married before, and that I have caused him to commit bigamy. That's pleasant conversation for a honeymoon, isn't it? Who is she? Oh, she's quite an old friend of mine, said Georgie, though I never knew she had met you before. I'm devoted to her. Extremely proper, but now tell me this, and look straight in my face, so that I shall know if you're speaking the truth. Should I enjoy myself more wandering about this heavenly place than at her garden party? Georgie felt that poor Lucia was really punished enough by this time. "'You will give her a great deal of pleasure if you go,' he began. "'Ah, oh, that's not fair. It's hitting below the belt to appeal to unselfish motives. I have come here simply to enjoy myself. Go on, eyes front.' The candour and friendliness of that beautiful face gave Georgie an impulse of courage. 
Besides, though no doubt in fun, she had already suggested that it would be much nicer to wander about with him and dine together than spend the evening among the splendours of the hall. I've got a suggestion, he said. Will you come and lunch with me first, and we'll stroll about, and then we can go to the garden party, and if you don't like it, I'll take you away again. Done, she said. Now, don't you try to get out of it, because my husband is a witness. Georgie, give me a cigarette. In a moment, Rhizome Georgie had his cigarette case open. Do take one of mine, he said. I'm Georgie, too. You don't say. Let's send it to the Psychical Research, or whoever those people are who collect coincidences and say it's spooks. And a match, please, one of you Georges. Oh, how I should like never to see the inside of an opera house again. Why mayn't I grow on the walls of a garden like this? Or better still, why shouldn't I have a house and a garden of my own here, and sing on the village green and ask for halfpennies? Tell me what happens here. I've always lived in town since the time a hook-nosed Hebrew rather like Lady Ambermere took me out of the gutter. My dear, said Mr. Shuttleworth, well out of an orphan school at Brixton, and I would much prefer the gutter. That's all about my early life just now, because I am keeping it for my memoirs, which I shall write when my voice becomes a little more like a steam whistle. But don't tell Lady Ambermere, for she would have a fit. But say you happen to know that I belong to the Surrey bracelets. So I do. Brixton is on the Surrey side. Oh, my dear, look at the sun. It's behaving like the best sort of cloud. I les honne. I heard you do that last May, said George. Then you heard a most second-rate performance, said she. But really being unlaced by that thing, that great fat profligate beery Prussian, was almost too much for me. And the duet, but it was very polite of you to come, and I will do better next time. Siegfried, Brunhilde, Siegfried, meow, meow, bring on the next lot of cats. Darling Georgie, wasn't it awful? And you proposed to me only the day before. I was absolutely enchanted, said Rhizome Georgie. Yes, but then you didn't have that thing breathing beer into your innocent face. Georgie rose. The first call on a stranger in Rhizome was never supposed to last more than half an hour, however much you were enjoying it, and never less, however bored you might be, and he felt sure he had already exceeded this. I must be off, he said. Too delightful to think that you and Mr. Shuttleworth will come to lunch with me tomorrow. Half past one, shall we say? Excellent, but where do you live? Just across the green. Shall I call for you? he asked. Certainly not. Why should you have that bother? she said. Oh, let me come with you to the inn door, and perhaps you will show me from there. She passed through the hall with him, and they stood together in the sight of all Rhizome, which was strolling about the green, at this as at most other hours. Instantly all faces turned round in their direction, like so many sunflowers following the sun, while Georgie pointed out his particular mulberry tree. When everybody had had a good look, he raised his hat. A domani, then, she said. So many thanks. And quite distinctly she kissed her hand to him as he turned away. So, she talks Italian too, thought Georgie, as he dropped little crumbs of information to his friends on his way to his house. Domani, that means tomorrow. Oh yes, she was meaning lunch. It is hardly necessary to add that on the table in his hall there was one of Lucia's commoner kinds of note, merely a half-sheet folded together in her own manner. Georgie felt that it was scarcely more necessary to read it for he felt quite sure that it contained some excuse for not coming to his house at six in order to call on Mr. and Mrs. Braceley. But he gave a glance at it before he rolled it up in a ball for Tipsy Poozy to play with, and found its contents to be precisely what he expected, the excuse being that she had not done her practising. But the postscript was interesting, for it told him that she had asked Foljambi to give her his copy of Siegfried, Georgie strolled down past the hearst before dinner. Mozart was silent now, but there came out of the open windows the most amazing hash of sound, which he could just recognise as being the piano arrangement of the duet between Brunhilde and Siegfried at the end. He would have been dull indeed if he had not instantly guessed what that signified. End of chapter
Queen Lucia by E. F. Benson, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter Seven. A fresh thrill went through an atmosphere already supersaturated with excitement when next morning all Lucia's friends who had been bidden to the garden party, Titan, were rung up on the telephone and informed that the party was Hightum. That caused a good deal of extra work, because the Titum robes had to be put away again, and the Hightums aired and brushed and valeted. But it was well worth it, for Rhizom had not the slightest difficulty in conjecturing that Olga Bracely was to be among the guests. For a cultured and artistic centre, the presence of a star that blazed so regally in the very zenith of the firmament of art absolutely demanded the Hightum, which the presence of poor Lady Ambermere, though she would not have liked that, had been powerless to bring out of their cupboards. And these delightful anticipations concentrated themselves into one rose-coloured point of joy, when no less than two independent observers, without collusion, saw the piano tuner either entering or leaving the hearst, while a third and ear witness unmistakably heard the tuning of the piano actually going on. It was thus clear to all penetrating minds that Olga Bracely was going to sing. It was further known that something was going on between her and Georgie, for she had been heard by one misanthropus to ask for Georgie's number at the telephone in the Ambermere Arms. Etiquette forbade her actually to listen to what passed, but she could not help hearing Olga laugh at something, presumably, that Georgie said. He himself took no part in the Green Parliament that morning, but had been seen to dash into the fruiterers and out again before he went in a great hurry to the hearst shortly after twelve thirty. Classes on Eastern philosophy under the tuition of Mrs. Quantock's Indian were already beginning to be hinted at, but today, in the breathless excitement about the prima donna, nobody cared about that. They might all have been taking lessons in cannibalism, and nobody would have been interested. Finally, about one o'clock, one of the motors in which the party had arrived yesterday drew up at the door of the Ambermere Arms, and presently Mr. Bracely, no dear, Mr. Shuttleworth, got in and drove off alone. That was very odd conduct in a lately married bridegroom, and it was hoped that there had been no quarrel. Olga had, of course, been given no directions as to Hightum or Titum, and when she walked across to George's house shortly after half-past one, only Mrs. Weston, who was going back home to lunch at top speed, was aware that she was dressed in a very simple dark blue morning frock. That would almost have passed for scrub. It is true that it was exceedingly well cut, and had not the look of having been rolled up in a ball and hastily ironed out again, that usually distinguished scrub and she also wore a string of particularly fine pearls round her neck, the sort of ornament that in Rhizom would only be seen in an evening Hightum, even if anybody in Rhizom had owned such things. Lucia, not long ago, had expressed the opinion that jewels were vulgar except at night, and for her part she wore none at all, preferring one Greek cameo of uncertain authenticity. Georgie received Olga alone, for Hermy and Ursie were not yet back from their gulf. It is good of you to let me come without my husband, she said. His excuse is toothache, and he's driven into Brinton. I am very sorry, said Georgie. You needn't be, for now I'll tell you his real reason. He thought that if he lunched with you, he would have to come on to the garden party, and that he was absolutely determined not to do. You were the thin end of the wedge, in fact. My dear, what a delicious house, all panelled with that lovely garden behind and croquet. May we play croquet after lunch? I always try to cheat, and if I'm found out I lose my temper. Georgie won't play with me, so I play with my maid. This Georgie will, said he. How nice of him! And do you know what we did this morning before the toothache didn't begin? We went all over that house three doors away, which is being done up. It belongs to the proprietor of the Ambermere Arms, and, oh, I wonder if you can keep a secret? Yes, said Georgie. He probably had never kept one yet, but there was no reason why he shouldn't begin now. Well, I'm absolutely determined to buy it, only I daren't tell my husband until I've got it. He has an odd nature, 
when a thing is done settled and there's no help for it he finds it adorable but he also finds fatal objections to doing it at all if he is consulted about it before it is done so not a word i shall buy it make the garden furnish it down to the minutest detail and engage the servants and then he'll give it me for a birthday present i had to tell somebody or i should burst georgie nearly swooned with fervour and admiration but what a perfect plan he said you really like our little rhizome it's not a question of liking it's a mere detail of not being able to do without it i don't like breathing but i should die if i didn't i want some delicious hole-in-the-corner lazy backwater sort of place where nothing ever happens and nobody ever does anything i've been observing all the morning and your habits are adorable nothing ever happens here and that will precisely suit me when i get away from my work georgie was nearer swooning than ever at this he could hardly believe his ears when she talked of rhizome being a lazy backwater and almost thought she must have been speaking of london where as lucia had acutely observed people sat in the park all morning and talked of each other's affairs and spent the afternoon at picture galleries and danced all night there was a flippant lazy existence but she was far too much absorbed in her project to notice his stupefaction but if you breathe a word she said everything will be spoilt it has to burst on georgie oh and there's another mulberry tree in your garden as well as the one in the front it's too much her eyes followed foljambi out of the door and i know your parlour-maid is called paravicini or grosvenor she said no she's foljambi said georgie she laughed i knew i was right she said it's practically the same thing oh and last night i never had such an awful evening why didn't you warn me and my husband should have had the toothache then instead of this morning what happened asked he but the woman's insane that ambermere parrot i mean georgie and i were ten minutes late and she had a jet tiara on and why did she ask us to dine at a quarter to eight if she meant a quarter to eight instead of saying half past seven they were actually going into dinner when we came a mournful procession of three moth-eaten men and three whiskered women upon which the procession broke up as if we had been the riot act and was arranged again as a funeral procession and georgie with lady ambermere was the hearse we dined in the family vault and talked about lady ambermere's pug she talked about you too and said you were of county family and that mrs lucas was a very decent sort of woman and that she herself was going to look in on her garden party today then she looked at my pearls and asked if they were genuine so i looked at her teeth and there was no need to ask about them don't miss out a moment said georgie greedily whenever lady ambermere spoke everybody else was silent i didn't grasp that at first for no one had explained the rules so she stopped in the middle of a sentence and waited till i had finished then she went on again precisely where she had left off then when we came into the drawing-room the whiskered ladies and i there was a little woman like a mouse sitting there and nobody introduced her so naturally i went to talk to her before which the great parrot said will you kindly fetch my wool-work miss lyle and miss lyle took a sack out of the corner and inside was the sacred carpet and then i waited for some coffee and cigarettes and i waited and i waited and i am waiting still the parrot said that coffee always kept her awake and that was why and then georgie came in with the others and i could see by his face that he hadn't had a cigarette either it was then half past nine and then each man sat down between two women and pug sat in the middle and looked for fleas then lady ambermere got up and came across the charmed circle to me she said i hope you have brought your music mrs shuttleworth kindly open the piano miss lyle it was always considered a remarkably fine instrument olga waved the fork on which was impaled a piece of the pineapple which georgie had purchased that morning at the fruiterer's the stupendous cheek she said i thought it must be a joke and laughed with the greatest politeness but it wasn't you'll hardly believe it but it wasn't 
one of the whiskered ones said that will be a great treat and another put on the face that everyone wears at concerts and i was so stunned that i sang and lady ambermere beat time and the pug barked she pointed a finger at georgie never till the day of judgment she said when lady ambermere gnashes her beautiful teeth for ever and ever will i set foot in that house again nor she in my house i will set fire to it sooner there my dear what a good lunch you have given me may we play croquet at once lucia's garden parties were scheduled from four to seven and half an hour before the earliest guest might be expected she was casting an eagle eye over the preparations which to-day were on a very sumptuous scale the bowls were laid out in the bowling alley not because anybody in hightum's dresses was the least likely to risk the stooping down and strong movements that the game entailed but because bowls were elizabethan between the alley and the lawn nearer to the house was a large marquee where the commoner crowd though no crowd could be really common in rhizome would refresh itself but even where none are common there may still be degrees in rarity and by the side of this general refreshment room was a smaller tent carpeted with oriental rugs and having inside it some half dozen chairs and two seats which can only be described as thrones for Lady Ambermere or Olga Bracely, while Lucia's guru, though throne-worthy, would very kindly sit in one of his most interesting attitudes on the floor. This tent was designed only for high converse, and common guests, if they were good, would be led into it and introduced to the great presences, while for the refreshment of the presences, in intervals of audience a more elaborate meal with peaches and four sorts of sandwiches was laid in the smoking parlour thus those guests for whom audiences were not provided could have the felicity of seeing the great ones pass across the lawn on their excursions for food and possibly trip over the croquet hoops which had been left up to give an air of naturalness to the lawn in the smoking parlour an elsevier or two were left negligently open as if mr and mrs lucas had been reading the works of perseus and juvenal when the first guests arrived in the music-room finally which was not usually open on these occasions there were fresh flowers the piano too was open and if you had not seen the elseviers in the smoking parlour it would have been reasonable for the early guests if they penetrated here to imagine that Mrs. Lucas had been running over the last act of Siegfried a minute before. In this visit of final inspection, Lucia was accompanied by her guru, for he was part of the domestic dramatis personae, and she wanted him to be discovered in the special tent. She pointed out the site of his proposed discovery to him. Probably the first person I shall bring in here, she said, will be Lady Ambermere, or she is noted for her punctuality she is so anxious to see you and would it not be exciting if you found you had met before her husband was governor of madras and she spent many years in india madras gracious lady asked the guru i do know madras there are many dark spirits in madras and she was at the english residency yes she says mr kipling knows nothing about india you and she will have much to talk about. I wish I could sit on the floor, too, and listen to what you say to each other. It will be a great treat, said the guru thoughtfully. I love all who love my wonderful country. Suddenly he stopped and put his hands up to his head, palms outwards. There are wonderful vibrations today, he said. All day I feel that some word is on way from the guide, some great message of light oh wouldn't it be wonderful if it came to you in the middle of my garden party said lucia enthusiastically ah gracious lady the great word comes not so it comes always in solitude and quiet gracious lady knows that as well as guru pure guruism and social preeminence struggled together in lucia guruism told her that she ought to be ecstatic at the idea of a great message coming and should instantly smile on his desire for solitude and quiet while social preeminence whispered to her that she had already dangled the presence of a high caste mystic from benares before the eyes of lady ambermere who only came from madras 
On the other hand, Olga Bracely was to be an even more resplendent guest than either Lady Ambermere or the Guru. Surely Olga Bracely was enough to set this particular garden party on the giddiest of pinnacles. And an awful consequence lurked as a possibility if she attempted to force her Guru not to immune himself in solitude and quiet, which was that conceivably he might choose to go back to the pit whence he was digged, namely the house of poor Daisy Quantock. The thought was intolerable, for with him in her house she had seen herself as dispenser of Eastern mysteries and mistress of omism to Rhizom. In fact, the Guru was her August stunt. It would never do to lose him before the end of July, and rage to see all Rhizom make pilgrimages to Daisy. There was a thin-lipped firmness, too, about him at this moment. She felt that under provocation he might easily defy or desert her. She felt she had to yield, and so decided to do so in the most complete manner. Ah, yes, she said, I know how true that is, dear Guru. Go up to Hamlet, no one will disturb you there. But if the message comes through before Lady Ambermere goes away, promise me you will come back. He went back to the house where the front door was already open to admit Lady Ambermere, who was telling her people when to come back for her and fled with the heels of his slippers tapping on the oak stairs up to Hamlet. Softly he shut out the dark spirits from Madras, and made himself even more secure by turning the key in his door. It would never do to appear as a high-caste Brahmin from Benares before anyone who knew India with such fatal intimacy, for he might not entirely correspond with her preconceived notions of such a person. Lady Ambermere's arrival was soon followed by that of other guests, and instead of going into the special tent reserved for the lions, she took up a commanding position in the middle of the lawn, where she could examine everybody through her tortoiseshell-handled lorgnette. She kept Peppino by her, who darted forward to shake hands with his wife's guests, and then darted back again to her. Poor Miss Lyle stood behind her chair, and from time to time, as ordered, gave her a cape, or put up her parasol, or adjusted her footstool for her, or took up Pug, or put him down as her patroness required. Most of the time Lady Ambermere kept up a majestic monologue. "'You have a pretty little garden here, Mr. Lucas,' she said, though perhaps inconveniently small. Your croquet lawn does not look to me the full size, and then there is no tennis court. But I think you have a little strip of grass somewhere which you use for bowls, have you not? Presently I will walk round with you and see your domain. Put Pug down again, Miss Lyle, and let him run about. See, he wants to play with one of those croquet balls. Put it in motion for him, and he will run with it. Bless me, who is that coming up the path at such a tremendous speed in a bath chair? Oh, I see it is Mrs. Weston. She should not go as fast as that. If Pug was to stray on to the path, he would be run over. Better pick up Pug again, Miss Lyle, till she is gone by. And here is Colonel Boucher. If he had brought his bulldogs, I should have asked him to take them away again. I should like a cup of tea, Miss Lyle, with plenty of milk in it, and not too strong. You know how I like my tea, and a biscuit or something for Pug with a little cream in a saucer, or anything that's handy. Won't you come into the smoking parlour and have tea there, Lady Ambermere? asked Peppino. The smoking parlour? asked she. How very strange to lay tea in a smoking room. Peppino explained that nobody had in all probability used the smoking parlour to smoke in for five or six years. Oh, if that is so, I'll come, she said. Better bring Pug along too, Miss Lyle. There is a croquet hoop. I am glad I saw it, or I should have stumbled over it, perhaps. Oh, this is the smoking parlour, is it? Why do you have rushes on the floor? Put Pug in a chair, Miss Lyle, or he may prick his paws. Books, too, I see. That one lying open is an old one. It's Latin poetry. The library at the hall is very famous for its classic literature. The first Viscount collected it, and it numbers many thousands of volumes. Indeed, it is a most wonderful library, said Peppino. I can never tear myself away from it when I'm at the hall. I do not wonder. I am a great student myself, and often spend a morning there, do I not, Miss Lyle? 
You should have some new glass put in those windows, Mr. Lucas. On a dark day, it must be very difficult to see here. By the way, your good wife told me that there would probably be a very remarkable Indian at her party, a Brahmin from Benares, she said. I should like to have a talk with him while I'm having my tea. Kindly prepare a peach for me, Miss Lyle. Peppino had heard about the retirement of the Guru in consequence of a message from the guides being expected, and proceeded to explain this to Lady Ambermere, who did not take the slightest notice as she was looking at the peaches through her lorgnette. That one nearest to me looks eatable, she said, and then I do not see Miss Olga Braceley, though I distinctly told her I should be here this afternoon, and she said Mrs. Lucas had asked her. She sang to us yesterday evening at the hall, and very creditably indeed. Her husband, Mr. Shuttleworth, is a cousin of the late Lord's. Lucia had come into the smoking parlour during this speech, and heard these fatal words. At the moment she would gladly have recalled her invitation to Olga Braceley altogether, sooner than have alluded therein to Mr. Braceley. But that was one of the irremediable things of life, and since it was no use wasting regret on that, she was only the more eager for Olga to come, whatever her husband's name was. She braced herself up to the situation. Peppino, are you looking after Lady Ambermere? she said. Dear Lady Ambermere, I hope they're all taking care of you. A very decent peach, said Lady Ambermere. The south wall of my garden is covered with them, and they're always a peculiarly delicious flavour. The hall is famed for its peaches. I understood that Miss Braceley was going to be here, Mrs. Lucas. I cannot imagine what makes her so late. I was always famed for my punctuality myself. I finished my tea. The lawn outside was now growing thick with people all in their items, and Lady Ambermere, as she emerged from the smoking parlour again, viewed the scene with marked disfavour. The two Miss Antrobuses had just arrived, and skipped up to their hostess with pretty cries. We are dreadfully late, said the eldest but it was all Piggy's fault. No, Goosey, it was yours, said the other. How can you be so naughty as to say it was mine? Dear Mrs. Lucas, what a lovely party it's being, and may we go and play bowls? Lady Ambermere regarded their retreating backs as they raced off with arms intertwined to the bowling green. And who are those young ladies, she asked, and why Piggy and Goosey? Miss Lyle, do not let Pug go to the bowls, they are very heavy. Elsewhere, Mrs. Antrobus was slowly advancing from group to group, with her trumpet violently engaged in receiving refreshment. But conversation was not quite so varied as usual, for there was an attitude of intense expectation with regard to the appearance of Miss Braceley that made talk rather jerky and unconnective. Then also it had gone about that the mysterious Indian, who had been seen now and then during the last week, was actually staying with Mrs. Lucas, and why was he not here? More unconjecturable yet, though not so thrillingly interesting, was the absence of Mr. Georgie. What could have happened to him that he was not flitting about on his hostess's errands and being the life and soul of the party? It was in vain that Mrs. Antropus plodded on her methodical course, seeking answers to all these riddles, and that Mrs. Weston, in her swifter progression, dashed about in her bath chair from group to group, wherever people seemed to be talking in an animated manner. She could learn nothing, and Mrs. Antrobus could learn nothing. In fact, the only information to be had on the subject was what Mrs. Weston herself supplied. She had a very high-coloured, handsome face and an extremely impressive manner, as if she was imparting information of the very highest importance. She naturally spoke in a loud, clear voice, so that she had not got to raise it much even when she addressed Mrs. Antrobus. Her wealth of discursive detail was absolutely unrivalled, and she was quite the best observer in Rizal. The last I saw of Miss Braceley, she said, exactly as if she had been told to describe something on oath in the witness box, was a little after half past one today. It must have been after half past, because when I got home it was close on a quarter to two, and I wasn't a hundred yards from my house when I saw her. As soon as I saw her, I said to my gardener boy, Henry Luton, who was pushing me, he's the son of old Mrs. Luton who kept the fish shop, and when she died last year, 
I began to get my fish from Brinton, for I didn't fancy the look of the new person who took on the business, and Henry went to live with his aunt. That was his father's sister, not his mother's, for Mrs. Luton never had a sister, and no brothers either. Well, I said to Henry, you can go a bit slower, Henry, as we're late, we're late, and a minute or two more doesn't make any difference. No, oh, ma'am, said Henry, touching his cap, so we went slower. Miss Bracely was just opposite the ducking pond then, and presently she came out between the elms. She had just an ordinary morning frock on. It was dark blue, about the same shade as your cape, Mrs. Antropus, or perhaps a little darker, for the sunshine brightened it up. Quite simple it was, nothing grand. And she looked at the watch on her wrist, and seemed to me to walk a little quicker after that, as if she was a bit late, just as I was. But slower than I was going, I could not go, for I was crawling along and before she got off the grass I had come to the corner of Church Lane, and though I turned my head round sharp like that at the very last moment, so as to catch the last of her, she hadn't more than stepped off the grass onto the road before the Loristinus on the corner of Colonel Boucher's garden. No, of the vicar's garden hid her from me, and if you ask me... Mrs. Weston stopped for a moment, nodding her head up and down to emphasise the importance of what she had said, and to raise the expectations of Mrs. Antrobus to the highest pitch as to what was coming. And if you ask me where I think she was going and what she was going to do, she said, I believe she was going out to lunch and that she was going to one of those houses there, just across the road, or she made a bee-line across the green towards them. Well, there are three houses there. There's Mrs. Quantock's, and it couldn't have been that or else Mrs. Quantock would have some news of her. Or Colonel Boucher's, and it wouldn't have been that, for the Colonel would have had news of her. And we all know whose the third house just there is. Mrs. Antropus had not completely followed this powerful reasoning. But Colonel Boucher and Mrs. Quantock are both here, eh? said she. Mrs. Weston raised her voice a little. That's what I'm saying, she announced but who isn't here whom we should expect to see, and where's his house? It was generally felt that Mrs. Weston had hit the nail on the head. What that nail precisely was, no one knew, because she had not explained why both Olga Bracely and Georgie were absentees. But now came the climax, bang on the top of the nail, a shrewd straight stroke. So there she was, having her lunch with Mr. Georgie, said Mrs. Weston, now introducing this name for the first time, with the highest dramatic art, and they would be seeing round his house afterwards, and then, when it was time to come here, Mr. Georgie would have remembered that the party was Hightum, not Titum, and there was Miss Bracely not in Hightum at all, nor even Titum, in my opinion, but Scrub. No doubt, she said to him, is it a very grand sort of party, Mr. Pilson? And he couldn't do other than reply, for we all received notice that it was Hightum. Mine came about twelve. He couldn't do other than reply, Yes, Miss Bracely, it is. Good gracious me, she would say, and I've only got this old rag on. I must go back to the Ambermere Arms, and tell my maid, for she brought a maid in that second motor, and tell my maid to put me out something tidy. But that will be a great bother for you, he would say, or something of that sort, for I don't pretend to know what he actually did say, and she would reply, Oh, Mr. Pilson, but I must put on something tidy, and it would be so kind of you if you would wait for me while I do that, and let us go together. That's what she said. Mrs. Weston made a sign to her gardener to proceed, wishing to leave the stage at the moment of climax. And that's why they're both late, she said, and was whirled away in the direction of the bowling green. The minutes went on, and still nobody appeared who could possibly have accounted for the three-lined whip of Hightums, but by degrees Lucia, who had utterly failed to decoy Lady Ambermere into the place of thrones, began to notice a certain thinning on her lawns. Her guests, it would seem, were not in process of dispersal, for it was a long way off seven o'clock yet, and also none would be so ill-mannered as to leave without shaking hands and say what a delicious afternoon they had spent. But certainly the lawns grew emptier, and she was utterly unable to explain this extraordinary phenomenon, until she happened to go close to the windows of her music room. Then, looking in, she saw that not only was every chair there occupied, 
but people were standing about in expectant groups. For a moment her heart beat high. Could Olga have arrived and by some mistake have gone straight in there? It was a dreamlike possibility, but it burst like a ray of sunshine on the party that was rapidly becoming a nightmare to her, for everyone, not Lady Ambermere alone, was audibly wondering when the Guru was coming and when Miss Bracely was going to sing. At the moment, as she paused, a window in the music room was opened, and Piggy's odious head looked out. Oh, Mrs. Lucas, she said, Goosey and I have got beautiful seats, and Mamma is quite close to the piano, where she will hear excellently. Has she promised to sing Siegfried? Is Mr. Georgie going to play for her? It's the most delicious surprise. How could you be so sly and clever as not to tell anybody? Lucia cloaked her rage under the most playful manner, as she ran into the music room through the hall. You naughty things, she said, do all come into the garden. It's a garden party, and I couldn't guess where you had all gone. What's all this about singing and playing? I know nothing of it. She herded the incredulous crowd out into the garden again, all in their items, every one of them, only to meet Lady Ambermere with Pug and Miss Lyle coming in. Better be going, Miss Lyle, she said. Kindly run out and find my people. Oh, here's Mrs. Lucas. Been very pleasant indeed, thank you. Good-bye, your charming garden, yes. Oh, but it's very early, said Lucia. It's hardly six yet. Indeed, said Lady Ambermere, being so charming. And she marched out, after Miss Lyle, out into Shakespeare's garden. It was soon terribly evident that other people were sharing Lady Ambermere's conclusion about the delights of the afternoon and the necessity of getting home. Colonel Boucher had to take his bulldogs for a run and walk off the excitement of the party. Piggy and Goosey explained to their mother that nobody was going to sing, and by silvery laughter tried to drown her just indignation, and presently Lucia had the agony of seeing Mrs. Quantock seated on one of the thrones that had been designed for much worthier ends, and Peppino sitting in the other, while a few guests drifted about the lawn with all the purposelessness of autumn leaves. What with the guru presumably meditating upstairs still, and with Olga Bracely most conspicuously absent, she had hardly nervous energy left to wonder what could have become of Georgie. Never in all the years of his ministry had he failed to be at her elbow through the entire duration of her garden parties, flying about on her errands like a tripping Hermes, herding her flocks if she wanted them in one part of the garden rather than another, like a sagacious sheepdog and coming back to heel again ready for further tasks. But today Georgie was mysteriously away, for he had neither applied for leave nor given any explanation, however improbable, of his absence. He at least would have prevented Lady Ambermere, the only cornerstone of the party, from going away in what must be called a huff, and have continued to tell Lucia how marvellous she was and what a beautiful party they were having. With the prospect of two other much more magnificent cornerstones, Lucia had not provided any further entertainment for her guests. There was not the conjurer from Brinton, nor the three young ladies who played banjo trios, nor even the mild performing doves which cooed so prettily, and walked up their mistress's outstretched fingers according to order if they felt disposed. There was nothing to justify Hytems, there was scarcely even sufficient to warrant Titums. Scrub was written all over the desert's dusty face. It was about half-past six when the miracles began, and without warning the guru walked out into the garden. Probably he had watched the departure of the great motor with its chauffeur and footman and Miss Lyle and Lady Ambermere and Pug, and with his intuitive sagacity had conjectured that the danger from Madras was over. He wore his new red slippers, a wonderful turban, and an ecstatic smile. Lucia and Daisy met him with cries of joy, and the remaining guests, those drifting autumn leaves, were swept up, as it were, by some compelling broom, and clustered in a heap in front of him. There had been a great message, a word of might, full of love and peace. Never had there been such a word. And then, even before they had all felt the full thrill of that, once more the door from the house opened, and out came Olga Bracely and Georgie. It is true that she had still her blue morning frock, which Mrs. Weston had designated as scrub, but it was a perfectly new scrub. 
and if it had been completely covered with Paris labels, they would not have made its provenance one whit clearer. Dear Mrs. Lucas, she said, Mr. Georgie and I are terribly late, and it was quite my fault. There was a game of croquet that wouldn't come to an end, and my life has been guided by only one principle, and that is to finish a game of croquet whatever happens. I missed six trains once by finishing a game of croquet. And Mr. Georgie was so unkind, he wouldn't give me a cup of tea or let me change my frock, but dragged me off to see you. And I won. The autumn leaves turned green and vigorous again, while Georgie went to get refreshment for his conqueror, and they were all introduced. She allowed herself to be taken with the utmost docility, how unlike somebody, into the tent with the thrones. She confessed to having stood on tiptoe and looked into Mrs. Quantock's garden and wanted to see it so much from the other side of the wall. And this garden, too, might she go and wander all over this garden when she had finished the most delicious peach that the world held? She was so glad she had not had tea with Mr. Georgie, he would never have given her such a good peach. Now the departing guests in their items lingering on the village green a little, and being rather sarcastic about the utter failure of Lucia's party, could hardly help seeing Georgie and Olga emerge from his house and proceed swiftly in the direction of the hearst, and Mrs. Antropus, who retained marvellous eyesight as compensation for her defective hearing, saw them go in, and simultaneously thought that she had left her parasol at the hearst. Next moment she was walking thoughtfully away in that direction. Mrs. Weston had been the next to realise what had happened, and though she had to go round by the road in her bath chair, she passed Mrs. Antropus a hundred yards from the house, her pretext for going back being that Lucia had promised to lend her the book by Antonio Caporelli, or was it Caporelto? So once more the door into the garden opened, and out shot Mrs. Weston. Olga by this time had made her tour of the garden, and might she see the house? She might. There was a pretty music room, at this stage just as Mrs. Weston was poured out into the garden, as with the floodgates being unopened, the crowd that followed her came surging into Shakespeare's garden, and never had the mermaid's tail, behind which was secreted the electric bell, experienced such feverish usage. Pressure after pressure invoked its aid, and the pretext for readmission was soon not made at all, or simply disregarded by the parlour-maid. Colonel Boucher might have left a bulldog, and Mrs. Antropus an ear-trumpet, or Miss Antropus Piggy a shoelace, and the other Miss Antropus Goosey a shoehorn, but in brisk succession the guests who had been so sarcastic about the party on the village green jostled each other in order to revisit the scenes of their irony. Miss Olga Braceley had been known to enter the portals, and as many of them who entered after her found a guru as well. Olga was in the music room when the crowd had congested the hall. People were introduced to her, and sank down into the nearest chairs. Mrs. Antropus took up her old place by the keyboard of the piano. Everybody seemed to be expecting something, and by degrees the import of their longing was borne in upon Olga. They waited, and waited, and waited, much as she had waited for a cigarette the evening before. She looked at the piano, and there was a comfortable murmur from her audience. She looked at Lucia, who gave a great gasp and said nothing at all. She was the only person present who was standing now, except her hostess and Mrs. Weston's gardener, who had wheeled his mistress' chair into an admirable position for hearing. She was not too well pleased, but after all. Would you like me to sing? she asked Lucia. Yes, ah! There's a copy of Siegfried. Do you play? Lucia could not smile any more than she was smiling already. Is it very diffy? she asked. Could I read it, Georgie? Shall I try? She slid on to the music stool. Me to begin? she asked, finding that Olga had opened the book at the salutation of Brunhilde, which Lucia had practised so diligently all the morning. She got no answer. Olga, standing by her, had assumed a perfectly different aspect. For her gaiety, her lightness, was substituted some air of intense concentrated seriousness, which Lucia did not understand at all. She was looking straight in front of her, gathering herself in, and paying not the smallest attention to Lucia or anybody else. One, 
two said lucia three now and she plunged wildly into a sea of demi semi quavers olga had just opened her mouth but shut it again no she said once more and she whistled the motive oh it's so diffy said lucia beginning again georgie turn over georgie turned over and lucia counting audibly to herself made an incomparable mess all over the piano olga turned to her accompanist shall i try she said she sat down at the piano and made some sort of sketch of the accompaniment simplifying and yet retaining the essence and then she sang End of chapter. Queen Lucia by E. F. Benson. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 8. Throughout August, Guruism reigned supreme over the cultured life of Rhizom, and the priestess and dispenser of its mysteries was Lucia. Never before had she ruled from so elate a pinnacle, nor wielded so secure a supremacy. None had access to the Guru but through her. All his classes were held in the smoking parlour, and he meditated only in Hamlet, or in the sequestered arbour at the end of the Laburnum Walk. Once he had meditated on the village green, but Lucia did not approve of that, and had led him, still wrapped, home by the hand. The classes had swelled prodigiously, for practically all Rhizomites now were at some stage of instruction, with the exception of Hermy and Ursy, who pronounced the whole thing piffle, and, as gentle chaff for Georgie, sometimes stood on one leg in the middle of the lawn and held their breath. Then Hermy would say, one, two, three, and they shouted, Om, at the tops of their discordant voices. Now that the Guru was practically interned in the hearse, they had actually never set eyes on him, for they had not chosen to come to the Hightum garden party, preferring to have a second round of golf, and meeting Lucia next day had been distinctly irreverent on the subject of Eastern philosophy. Since then she had not been aware of their existence. Lucia now received special instruction from the Guru in a class all by herself, so prodigious was her advance in yoga, for she could hold her breath much longer than anybody else, and had mastered six postures, while the next class which she attended also consisted of the other original members, namely Daisy Quantock, Georgie and Peppino. They had got on very well too, but Lucia had quite shot away from them and now if the guru had other urgent spiritual claims on him she gave instruction to a less advanced class herself for this purpose she habited herself in a peculiarly becoming dress of white linen which reached to her feet and had full flowing sleeves like a surplice it was girdled with a silver cord with long tassels and had mother-of-pearl buttons and a hood at the back lined with white satin which came over her head Below its hem, as she sat and taught in a really rather advanced posture, showed the toes of her white Morocco slippers, and she called it her teacher's robe. The class which she taught consisted of Colonel Boucher, Piggy Antrobus, and Mrs. Weston. Sometimes the Colonel brought his bulldogs with him, who lay and snorted precisely as if they were doing breathing exercises too. A general air of joyful mystery and spiritual endeavour blew balmily round them all, and without any doubt the exercises and the deep breathing were extremely good for them. One evening, towards the end of the month, Georgie was sitting in his garden, for the half-hour before dressing time, thinking how busy he was, and yet how extraordinarily young and fresh he felt. Usually this month, when Hermie and Ursie were with him, was very fatiguing, and in ordinary years he would have driven away with Foljambi and Dicky on the day after their departure, and had a quiet week by the seaside. But now, though his sisters were going away to-morrow morning, he had no intention of taking a well-earned rest, in spite of the fact that not only had he been their host all this time, but had done an amazing quantity of other things as well. There had been the daily classes to begin with, which entailed much work in the way of meditation and exercises, as well as the actual learning, and also he had had another job, which might easily have taxed his energies to the utmost any other year, 
for Olga Braceley had definitely bought that house, without which she had felt that life was not worth living, and Georgie all this month had, at her request, been exercising a semi-independent supervision over its decoration and furnishing. She had ordered the general scheme herself, and had sent down from London the greater part of the furniture, but Georgie was commissioned to report on any likely pieces of old stuff that he could find, and, if expedition was necessary, to act on his own responsibility and buy them. But, above all, secrecy was still necessary till the house was so complete that her Georgie might be told. And, by the end of the month, Rhizome generally was in a state of prostration following on the violent and feverish curiosity as to who had taken the house. Georgie had gone so far as to confess that he knew, but the most pathetic appeals as to the owner's identity had fallen on obdurate, if not deaf, ears. Not the smallest hint would he give on the subject, and though those incessant visits to the house, those searchings for furniture, the bestowal of it in suitable places, the superintendence of the making of the garden, the interviewing of paper-hangers, plumbers, upholsterers, painters, carpenters, and so forth, occupied a great deal of time, the delicious mystery about it all, and the fact that he was doing it for so adorable a creature, rendered his exertions a positive refreshment. Another thing which, in conjunction with this and his youth-giving studies, made him feel younger than ever, was the discreet arrival and perfect success of his toupee. No longer was there any need to fear the dislocation of his espaliered locks. He felt so secure and undetectable in that regard, that he had taken to wearing no hat, and was soon about to say that his hair was growing more thickly than ever in consequence. But it was not quite time for that yet. It would be inartistic to suggest that just a couple of weeks of hatlessness had produced so desirable a result. As he sat at ease after the labours of the day, he wondered how the coming of Olga Bracely to Rizal would affect the economy of the place. It was impossible to think of her, with her beauty, her charm, her fame, her personality, as taking any second place in its life unless she was really meaning to use Rhizome as a retreat, to take no part in its life at all, it was hard to see what part she would take, except the first part. One who, by her arrival at Lucia's ever-memorable party, had converted it in a moment, from the most dire of scrubs, in a psychical sense, to the heightermist gathering ever known, could not lay aside her distinction and preeminence. Never had Lucia scored so amazingly as over Olga's late appearance, which had the effect of bringing back all her departed guests with the compulsion of a magnet over iron filings, and sending up the whole party like a rocket into the zenith of social success. All Rhizome knew that Olga had come, after playing croquet with Georgie the entire afternoon, and had given them free, gratis, and for nothing such a treat as only the wealthiest could obtain with the most staggering fees. Lady Ambermere alone, driving back to the hall with Pug and poor Miss Lyle, was the only person who had not shared in that. And she knew all about it next day, for Georgie had driven out on purpose to tell her, and met Lucia coming away. How, then, would the advent of Olga affect Rhizome's social working generally? And how would it affect Lucia in particular? And what would Lucia say when she knew on whose behalf Georgie was so busy with plumbers and painters, and with buying so many of the desirable treasures in the Ambermere Arms? Frankly, he could not answer these conundrums. They presupposed inconceivable situations, which, yet, though inconceivable, were shortly coming to pass or Olga's advent might be expected before October, that season of tea-parties that ushered in the multifarious gaieties of the winter. Would Olga form part of the moonlight circle to whom Lucia played the first movement of the moonlight sonata, and give a long sigh at the end like the rest of them? And would Lucia, when they had all recovered a little from the invariable emotion, go to her and say, Olga mia, just a little bit out of the Valkyrie? It would be so pleasant. Somehow Georgie, with all his imagination, could not picture such a scene. And would Olga take the part of second citizeness, or something of the sort, when Lucia played Portia? Would Olga join the elementary class of yoga, and be instructed by Lucia in her teacher's robe? 
would she sing treble in the Christmas carols? While Lucia beat time and said in syllables dictated by the rhythm, Treble's a little flat, my poor ears. Georgie could not imagine any of these things, and yet, unless Olga took no part in the social life of Rhizome at all, and that was equally inconceivable, what was the alternative? True, she had said that she was coming here because it was so ideally lazy a backwater, but Georgie did not take that seriously. She would soon see what Rhizome was when its life poured down in spate, whirling her punt along with it. And, finally, what would happen to him when Olga was set as a shining star in this firmament? Already he revolved about her. He was aware, like some eager, delighted little moon, drawn away from the orbit where it had encircled so contentedly by the more potent planet. And the measure of his detachment from that old orbit might be judged precisely by the fact that the process of detachment, which was already taking place, was marked by no sense of the pull of opposing forces at all. The great new star sailing into the heavens had just picked him up by force of its superior power of attraction, even as by its momentary conjunction with Lucia at the garden party it had raised her to a magnitude she had never possessed before. That magnitude was still Lucia's, and no doubt would be until the great star appeared again. Then, without effort, its shining must surely eclipse every other illumination, just as without effort it must surely attract all the little moons to itself. Or would Lucia manage somehow or other, either by sheer force of will, by desperate and hostile endeavour, or, on the other hand, by some supreme tact and cleverness, to harness the great star to her own chariot? He thought the desperate and hostile endeavour was more in keeping with Lucia's methods, and this quiet evening hour represented itself to him as the lull before the storm. The actual quiet of the moment was suddenly broken into. His front door banged, and the house was filled with running footsteps and screams of laughter. But it was not uncommon for Hermy and Ursy to make this sort of entrance and at the moment Georgie had not the slightest idea of how much further reaching was the disturbance of the tranquillity. He but drew a couple of long breaths, said ohm once or twice, and was quite prepared to find his deeper calm unshattered. Hermie and Ursie ran down the steps into the garden where he sat still yelling with laughter, and still Georgie's imagination went no further than to suppose that one of them had laid a stymie for the other at their golf, or driven a ball out of bounds, or done some other of these things that appeared to make the game so diverting to them. Georgie, you'll never guess, cried Hermie. The guru, the ohm of high caste and extraordinary sanctity, cried Ursi. The Brahmin from Benares, shrieked Hermie. The great teacher, who do you think he is, said Ursi. we never seen him before, but we recognised him at once. He recognised us too, and didn't he run? Into the hearst and shut the door. Georgie's deep calm suddenly quivered like a jelly. My dears, you needn't howl so, or talk quite so loud, he said. All Rhizome will hear you. Tell me, without shouting, who it was you thought you recognised. There's no think about it, said Hermie. It was one of the cooks from the Calcutta restaurant in Bedford Street. Where we often have lunch, said Ursie, he makes the most delicious curries. Especially when he's a little tipsy, said Hermie, and is about as much a Brahmin as I am, and always said he came from Madras. We always tip him to make the curry himself, so he isn't quite ignorant about money. Oh, Lord, said Hermie, wiping her eyes, if it isn't the limit. And to think of Mrs. Lucas and Colonel Boucher and you and Mrs. Quantock and Piggy and all the rest of them sitting round a cook, said Ursy, and drinking in his wisdom. Mr. Quantock was on the right track after all when he wanted to engage him. Georgie, with a fallen heart, had first to satisfy himself that this was not one of his sister's jokes, and then tried to raise his fallen heart by remembering that the Guru had often spoken of the dignity of simple manual work but somehow it was a blow, if Hermie and Ursie were right, to know that this was a tipsy contriver of curry. There was nothing in the simple manual office of curry-making that could possibly tarnish sanctity, but the amazing tissue of falsehoods with which the guru had modestly masked his innocent calling was not so markedly in the spirit of the guides as retailed by him. 
It was of the first importance, however, to be assured that his sisters had not at present communicated their upsetting discovery to anybody but himself, and after that to get their promise that they would not do so. This was not quite so easy, for Hermie and Ursy had projected a round of visits after dinner to every member of the classes, with the exception of Lucia, who should wake up next morning to find herself the only illusioned person in the place. She wouldn't like that, you know, said Hermie, with brisk malice. We thought it would serve her out for never asking us to her house again after her foolish old garden party. My dear, you never wanted to go, said Georgie. I know we didn't, but we rather wanted to tell her we didn't want to go. She wasn't nice, though I don't think we can give up telling everybody. It has made such sillies of you all. I think he's a real sport. So do I, said Ursy. We shall soon have him back at his curry oven again. What a laugh we shall have with him. They subsided for just as long as it took Foljambi to come out of the house, inform them that it was a quarter of an hour to dinner time, and return again. They all rose obediently. Well, we'll talk about it at dinner time, said Georgie diplomatically, and I'll just go down to the cellar first to see if I can find something you like. Good old Georgie, said Hermie, but if you're going to bribe us, you must bribe us well. We'll see, said he. Georgie was quite right to be careful over his verve Clico, especially since it was a bottle of that admirable beverage that Hermie and Ursy had looted from his cellar on the night of their burglarious entry. He remembered that well, though he had, chiefly from the desire to keep things pleasant about his hair, joined in the fun, and had even produced another half-bottle. But tonight, even more than then, there was need for the abolition of all petty economies, for the situation would be absolutely intolerable if Hermie and Ursy spread about Rhizome the fact that the introducers and innermost circle of yoga philosophers had sat at the feet of no Gamaliel at all, but at those of a curry cook from some low restaurant. Indeed, he brought up a second bottle tonight, with a view if Hermie and Ursy were not softened by the first, to administer that also. They would then hardly be in a condition to be taken seriously if they still insisted on making a house-to-house -house visit in Rhizome, and tearing the veil from off the features of the Guru. Georgie was far too upright of purpose to dream of making his sisters drunk, but he was willing to make great sacrifices in order to render them kind. What the inner circle would do about this cook he had no idea. He must talk to Lucia about it before the advance class tomorrow morning. But anything was better than letting Hermie and Ursy loose in Rhizome with their rude laughs and discreditable exposures. This evening, safely over, he could discuss with Lucia what was to be done, for Hermie and Ursy would have vanished at cockcrow as they were going in for some golf competition at a safe distance. Lucia might recommend doing nothing at all, and wish to continue enlightening studies as if nothing had happened. But Georgie felt that the romance would have evaporated from the classes as regards himself. Or again, they might have to get rid of the guru somehow. He only felt quite sure that Lucia would agree with him that Daisy Quantock must not be told. She, with her thwarted ambitions of being the prime dispenser of guruism to rise on, might easily turn nasty, and let it be widely known that she and Robert had seen through that fraud long ago, and had considered whether they should not offer the guru the situation of cook in their household, for which he was so much better qualified. She might even add that his leanings towards her pretty housemaid had alone dissuaded her. The evening went off with a success more brilliant than Georgie had anticipated, and it was quite unnecessary to open the second bottle of champagne. Hermie and Ursy, perhaps under the influence of the first, perhaps from innate good nature, perhaps because they were starting so very early next morning and wanted to be driven into Brinton, instead of taking a slower and earlier train at this station, readily gave up their project of informing the whole of Rhizom of their discovery, and went to bed as soon as they had rooked their brother of eleven shillings at Cutthroat Bridge. They continued to say, I'll play the guru, whenever they had to play a knave, but Georgie found it quite easy to laugh at that, so long as the humour of it did not spread. He even himself said, I'll guru you then, when he took a trick with the knave of trumps. 
The agitation and uncertainty caused him not to sleep very well, and in addition there was a good deal of disturbance in the house, for his sisters had still all their packing in front of them when they went to bed, and the doze that preceded sleep was often broken by the sound of the banging of luggage, the clash of golf clubs, and steps on the stairs as they made ready for their departure. But after a while these disturbances ceased, and it was out of a deep sleep that he awoke with the sense that some noise had awakened him. Apparently they had not finished yet, for there was surely some faint stir of movement somewhere. Anyhow, they respected his legitimate desire for quiet, for the noise, whatever it was, was extremely stealthy and subdued. He thought of his absurd lark about burglars on the night of their arrival, and smiled at the notion. His toupee was in a drawer close to the bed, but he had no substantial impulse to put it on and make sure that the noise was not anything other than his sister's preparations for their early start. For himself he would have had everything packed and corded long before dinner if he was to start next day, except just a suitcase that would hold the apparatus of immediate necessities. But then dear Hermie and Ursie were so ramshackle in their ways. Sometime he would have bells put on all the shutters, as he had determined to do a month ago, and then no sort of noise would disturb him any more. The yoga class next morning was unusually to assemble at ten, since Peppino, who would not miss it for anything, was going to have a day's fishing in the happy stream that flowed into the Avon, and he wanted to be off by eleven. Peppino had made great progress lately, and had certainly curious dizzy symptoms when he meditated, which were highly satisfactory. Georgie breakfasted with his sisters at eight, they had enticed the motor out of him to convey them to Brinton, and when they were gone Foljambi informed him that the housemaid had a sore throat, and had not done the drawing-room. Foljambi herself would do it when she had cleaned the young ladies' rooms, there was a hint of scorn in this, upstairs and so Georgie sat on the window-seat of the dining-room, and thought how pleasant peace and quietness were. But just when it was time to start for the hearst, in order to talk over the disclosures of the night before with Lucia before the class, and perhaps to frame some secretive policy which would obviate further exposure, he remembered that he had left his cigarette-case, the pretty straw one with the turquoise in the corner, in the drawing-room, and went to find it. The window was open, and apparently Foljambi had just come in to let fresh air into the atmosphere, which Hermie and Ursy had so uninterruptedly contaminated last night with their fags, as they called them. But his cigarette-case was not on the table where he thought he had left it. He looked around, and then stood rooted to the spot. His glass case of treasures was not only open, but empty. Gone was the Louis the Sixteenth snuff-box, gone was the miniature of Karl Huth, gone the piece of bow china, and gone the Fabergé cigarette-case. Only the Queen Anne toy porringer was there, and in the absence of the others it looked to him, as no doubt it had looked to the burglar, indescribably insignificant. Georgie gave a little low wailing cry, but did not tear his hair for obvious reasons. Then he rang the bell three times in swift succession which was the signal to Foljambi that even if she was in her bath she must come at once. In she came with one of Hermes' horrid woollen jerseys that had been left behind in her hand. Yes, sir, what is it? she asked, in an agitated manner, for never could she remember Georgie having rung the bell three times, except once when a fishbone had stuck in his throat, and once again when a note had announced to him that Piggy was going to call and hoped to find him alone. For answer, Georgie pointed to the rifled treasure-case. "'Gone! Burgled!' he said. "'Oh, my God!' At that supreme moment the telephone bell sounded. "'See what it is,' he said to Foljambi, and put the Queen Anne toy porringer in his pocket. She came hurrying back. "'Mrs. Lucas wants you to come round at once,' she said. "'I can't,' said Georgie. "'I must stop here and send for the police. Nothing must be moved.' and he hastily replaced the toy porringer on the exact circle of pressed velvet where it had stood before. Yes, sir, said Foljambi, but in another moment she returned. She would be very much obliged if you would come at once, she said. There's been a robbery in the house. Well, tell her there's been one in mine, said George irritably. 
Then good nature mixed with furious curiosity came to his aid. Wait here then, Foljambi, on this very spot, he said, and see that nobody touches anything. I shall probably ring up the police from the hearst. Admit them. In his agitation he put on his hat instead of going bareheaded, and was received by Lucia, who had clearly been looking out of the music-room window, at the door. She wore her teacher's robe. Georgie, she said, quite forgetting to speak Italian in her greeting, someone broke into Philip's safe last night and took a hundred pounds in banknotes. He had put them there only yesterday in order to pay in cash for that cob, and my Roman pearls. Georgie felt a certain pride of achievement. I've been burgled too, he said. My Louis the Sixteenth snuff-box is worth more than that. And there's the piece of bow china and the cigarette case and the Karl Huth as well. My dear, come inside, she said. It's a gang, and I was feeling so peaceful and exalted. It will make a terrible atmosphere in the house. My guru will be profoundly affected. An atmosphere where thieves have been will stifle him. He has often told me how he cannot stop in a house where there have been any wicked emotions at play. I must keep it from him. I cannot lose him. Lucia had sunk down on a spacious Elizabethan settle in the hall. The humorous spider mocked them from the window, the humorous stone fruit from the plate beside the potpourri bowl. Even as she repeated, I cannot lose him, again, a tremendous rap came on the front door, and Georgie, at a sign from his queen, admitted Mrs. Quantock. Robert and I have been burgled, she said, four silver spoons, thank God, most of our things are plate, eight silver forks, and a Georgian tankard. I could have spared all but the last. A faint sigh of relief escaped Lucia. If the foul atmosphere of thieves permeated Daisy's house, too, there was no great danger that her guru would go back there. She instantly became sublime. Peace, she said, let us have our class first for it is ten already, and not let any thought of revenge or evil spoil that for us. If I sent for the police now, I could not concentrate. I will not tell my guru what has happened to any of us. But for poor Peppino's sake, I will ask him to give us rather a short lesson. I feel completely calm. Om. Vague nightmare images began to take shape in George's mind unworthy suspicions based on his sister's information the evening before. But with Foljambi keeping guard over the Queen Anne Porringer, there was nothing more to fear, and he followed Lucia, her silver cord with tassels gently swinging as she moved, to the smoking parlour, where Peppino was already sitting on the floor, and breathing in a rather more agitated manner than was usual with the advanced class. There were fresh flowers on the table, and the scented morning breeze blew in from the garden. According to custom, they all sat down, and waited, and waited, getting calmer and more peaceful every moment. Soon there would be the tapping of slippered heels on the walk of broken paving stones outside, and for the time they would forget all these disturbances. But they were all rather glad that Lucia was to ask the guru to give them a shorter lesson than usual. They waited. Presently the hands of the Cromwellian timepiece, which was the nearest approach to an Elizabethan clock that Lucia had been able at present to obtain, pointed to a quarter past ten. My guru is a little late, said she. Two minutes afterwards Peppino sneezed. Two minutes after that, Daisy spoke, using irony. Would it not be well to see what has happened to your guru, dear? she asked. Have you seen your guru this morning? No, dear, said Lucia, not opening her eyes, for she was concentrating. He always meditates before a class. So do I, said Daisy, but I have meditated long enough. Hush, said Lucia, he is coming. That proved to be a false alarm, for it was nothing but Lucia's Persian cat, who had a quarrel with some dead laurel leaves. Lucia rose. I don't like to interrupt him, she said, but time is getting on. She left the smoking parlour with the slow, supple walk that she adopted when she wore her teacher's robes. Before many seconds had passed, she came back more quickly and with no suppleness. 
His door is locked, she said, and there's no key in it. Did you look through the keyhole, Lucia Mia? asked Mrs. Quantock, with irrepressible irony. Naturally, Lucia disregarded this. I knocked, she said, and there was no reply. I said, Master, we are waiting, and he didn't answer. Suddenly Georgie spoke as with the report of a cork flying out of a bottle. My sisters told me last night that he was the curry cook at the Calcutta restaurant, he said. They recognised him, and they thought he recognised them. He comes from Madras, and is no more a Brahmin than Foljambi. Peppino bounded to his feet. What? he said. Let's get a poker and break in the door. I believe he's gone, and I believe he's the burglar. Ring for the police. Curry cook, is he? said Daisy. Robert and I were right after all. We knew what your guru was best fitted for, dear Lucia. But then, of course, you always know best, and you and he have been fooling us finely. But you didn't fool me. I knew when you took him away from me what sort of a bargain you had made. Guru, indeed. He's the same class as Mrs. Eddy, and I saw through her fast enough. And now what are we to do? For my part, I shall just get home and ring up for the police, and say that the Indian, who has been living with you all these weeks, has stolen my spoons and forks. And my Georgian tankard, Guru, indeed, Burgalaru, I call him, there. Her passion, like Hyperion's, had lifted her upon her feet, and she stood there defying the whole of the advanced class, short and stout and wholly ridiculous, but with some revolutionary menace about her. She was not exactly terrible as an army with banners, but she was terrible as an elderly lady with a long-standing grievance that had been accentuated by the loss of a Georgian tankard, and that was terrible enough to make Lucia adopt a conciliatory attitude. Bitterly she repented having stolen Daisy's guru at all, if the suspicions now thickening in the air proved to be true. But after all, they were not proved yet. The guru might still walk in from the arbour on the laburnum alley which they had not yet searched, or he might be levitating with the door-key in his pocket. It was not probable, but it was possible. And at this crisis possibilities were things that must be clung to, for otherwise you would simply have to submerge like those U-boats. They searched all the garden, but found no trace of the curry cook. They made guarded inquiries of the servants as to whether he had been seen, but nothing whatever could be learned about him. So when Peppino took a ponderous hammer and a stout chisel from his tool chest and led the way upstairs, they all knew that the decisive moment had come. Perhaps he might be meditating, for indeed it was likely that he had a good deal to meditate about. But perhaps Peppino called to him in his most sonorous tones, and said that he would be obliged to break his lock if no answer came. And presently the house resounded with knockings as terrible as those in Macbeth, and much louder. Then suddenly the lock gave, and the door was open. The room was empty, as they had all conjectured by now. The bed was unslept in. They opened the drawers of the wardrobe, and they were as empty as the room. Finally Peppino unlocked the door of a large cupboard that stood in the corner, and with a clinking and crashing of glass there poured out a cataract of empty brandy bottles. Emptiness, that was the keynote of the whole scene, and blank consternation its effect. My brandy, said Mrs. Quantock in a strangled voice, there are fourteen or fifteen bottles. That accounts for the glazed look in his eyes which you, dear Lucia, thought was concentration. I call it distillation. Did he take it from your cellar? asked Lucia, too shattered to feel resentment, but still capable of intense curiosity. No, he had a standing order from me to order any little things he might want from my tradesmen. I wish I had my bill sent in every week. Yes, dear, said Lucia. George's eyes sought hers. I saw him buy the first bottle, he said. I remember telling you about it. It was at Rush's. Peppino gathered up his hammer and chisel. Well, it's no use sitting here and thinking of old times, he observed. I shall ring up the police station and put the whole matter into their hands, as far as I am concerned. They'll soon lay hands on him, and he can do his postures in prison for the next few years. But we don't know that it was he who committed all these burglaries yet, said Lucia. 
No one felt it was worth answering this, for the others had all tried and convicted him already. I shall do the same, said Georgie. My tankard, said Mrs. Quantock. Lucia got up. Peppina mio, she said, and you, Georgie, and you, Daisy. I want you, before you do anything at all, to listen to me for five minutes. Just consider this. What sort of figure shall we all cut if we put the matter into the hands of the police? They will probably catch him, and it will all come out that we have been the dupes of a curry cook. Think what we have all been doing for this last month. Think of our classes, our exercises, our everything. We have been made fools of. But for my part, I simply couldn't bear that everybody should know I have been made a fool of. Anything but that. What's a hundred pounds compared to that, or a tankard? My Louis the Sixteenth snuff-box was worth at least that without the other things, said Georgie, still with a secret satisfaction in being the greatest sufferer. And it was my hundred pounds, not yours, Carissima, said Peppino, but it was clear that Lucia's words were working within him like leaven. I'll go halves with you, she said. I'll give you a cheque for fifty pounds. And who would like to go halves in my tankard, said Daisy with bitter irony. I want my tankard. Georgie said nothing, but his mind was extremely busy. There was Olga soon coming to rise on, and it would be awful if she found it ringing with the tale of the guru, and glancing across to Peppino he saw a thoughtful and sympathetic look in his eyes that seemed to indicate that his mind was working on parallel lines. Certainly Lucia had given them all something to meditate upon. He tried to imagine the whole story being shouted into Mrs. Antropas' ear-trumpet on the village green, and could not endure the idea. He tried to imagine Mrs. Weston ever ceasing to talk about it, and could not picture her silence. No doubt they had all been taken in too, but here in this empty bedroom were the original dupes who encouraged the rest. After Mrs. Quantock's inquiry a dead silence fell. "'What do you propose, then?' asked Peppino, showing signs of surrender. Lucia exerted her utmost wiles. "'Caro,' she said, "'I want you to propose. Daisy and me, we silly women. We want you and Georgie to tell us what to do. But if Lucia must speak, I think—' She paused a moment, and, observing strong disgust at her playfulness on Mrs. Quantock's face, reverted to ordinary English again. I should do something of this sort, she said. I should say that dear Daisy's guru had left us quite suddenly, and that he has had a call somewhere else. His work here was done. He had established our classes, and set all our feet upon the way. He always said that something of the sort might happen to him. I believe he had it planned all along, said Georgie. He knew the thing couldn't last for ever, and when my sisters recognised him, he concluded it was time to bolt. With all the available property he could lay hands on, said Mrs. Quantock. Lucia fingered her tassel. Now, about the burglaries, she said. It won't do to let it be known that three burglaries were committed in one night, and that simultaneously Daisy's guru was called away. My guru, indeed, said Mrs. Quantock, fizzing with indignation at the repetition of this insult. That might give rise to suspicion, continued Lucia calmly, disregarding the interruption, and we must stop the news from spreading. Now, with regard to our burglary, let me think a moment. She had got such complete control of them all now that no one spoke. I have it, she said, only Bowler knows, for Peppino told her not to say a word till the police had been sent for. You must tell her, carissimo, that you have found the hundred pounds. That settles that. Now, you, Georgie. Foljambi knows, said Georgie. Then tell her not to say a word about it. Put some more things out in your lovely treasure case. No one will notice. And you, Daisy? Robert is away, said she, quite meekly, for she had been thinking things over. My maid knows. And when he comes back, will he notice the loss of the tankard? Did you often use it? About once in ten years. Chance it then, said Lucia. Just tell your maid to say nothing about it. She became deliciously modest again. There, she said, that's just a little rough idea of mine, and now Peppino and Georgie will put their wise heads together and tell us what to do. That was easily done. They repeated what she had said, and she corrected them if they went wrong. Then, once again, she stood fingering the tassels of her teacher's robe. About our studies, she said, 
I for one should be very sorry to drop them altogether, because they made such a wonderful difference to me, and I think you all felt the same. Look at Georgie now, he looks ten years younger than he did a month ago. And as for Daisy, I wish I could trip about as she does. And it wouldn't do, would it, to drop everything just because Daisy's guru, I mean our guru, had been called away. It would look as if we weren't really interested in what he taught us, as if it was only the novelty of having a, a Brahmin amongst us that attracted us at all. Lucia smiled benignly at them all. Perhaps we shall find by and by that we can't progress much all by ourselves, she said, and it will all drop quietly. But don't let us drop it with a bang. I shall certainly take my elementary class as usual this afternoon. She paused. In my robe, just as usual, she said. End of chapter.